Welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board. And um, thank you for uh, um, your patience. This meeting was supposed to have occurred on uh, Wednesday, but um, like much of the rest of the world, um, many members of the Green Mountain Care Board staff are dealing with uh, COVID as well. And so um, we had to uh, delay Wednesday meeting until today. And um, that brings up uh, something that I just want to uh, repeat. I've said it a few times before that even though today's discussion centers around um, how we move forward with sustainability planning, that doesn't mean that the board does not recognize the uh, situation that hospitals are in today. And we know that um, the number of COVID cases in hospitals has reached an alarming point. It's been an alarming point for a long period of time, and there's um, extreme stresses on anyone that's working in the healthcare system today. So um, I just want to again reiterate that nothing, um, nobody at the Green Mountain Care Board has insinuated that the board should get in the way of providers and their patients. And nobody at the Green Mountain Care Board has said anything about moving ICU beds or closing units. And um, I just want to re reiterate that what we're trying to facilitate is the beginning of what will take many, many months and possibly years to have a discussion and reach agreement with community members, hospitals, and all healthcare providers um, as we try to figure out how we have a system in Vermont that we can afford and is sustainable. And we know that there are incredible inflationary pressures on our healthcare system today, um, the largest of which right now are the workforce and we'll continue to try to deal with those. And I just want to say that um, we expect there to be inflationary pressures on health care costs of Vermont, but that doesn't mean that we can just sit idly by as health care costs inflation grows higher than um, the rate of other inflation. So um, again, this is just a conversation the early stages of a conversation. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to the executive director for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, I wanted to let the public and remind the board that we submitted two reports on January 15th. Actually, we submitted them on the 14th. And the first is our annual report for 2021. And the second is the Act 140 Section 10 report, which is entitled Opportunities for and Obstacles to Aligning and Reducing Prior Authorizations Under the All-Payer ACO Model. Both of these reports are available under What's New on our website. They'll also be filed under our legislative reports section. I'd also like to remind everyone of the ongoing public comment period regarding a potential next model with CMMI and the state of Vermont. We are asking the public to provide any uh, public comments on uh, their thoughts on a potential next model. We will share any of these comments obviously with the board, but also with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the potential next model. And then last, I just want to remind everyone that next Wednesday, January 26th, we'll be holding a hearing on the proposed um, ambulatory surgery center in Colchester. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to get make sure I have the right time. 9 a.m. Is that right, Mr. Chair? That's correct. Okay, great. And then in the afternoon, we'll be coming back to hear a presentation on the essential health benefits benchmark plan updates, as well as a continuation of um, sustainability uh, discussion leading into a discussion on 
2023 and beyond hospital budget guidance. That meeting in the afternoon starts at 1 p.m. our regularly scheduled meeting. <coughs> I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Just to add that we also uh, um, are extending an invitation to the Director of Healthcare Reform to update us on the uh, healthcare workforce plan if uh, she is so available um, next Wednesday, but at her earliest convenience. Um, it's often tricky. Um, people will ask board members questions about whether or not uh, all the different pieces were in the governor's budget, and um, it's hard to tell the, the way things are uh, uh, put together on a budget, and unless you're um, sitting in a committee that has uh, finance and management coming in and uh, explaining things like Tom has in the past as a member of the Appropriations Committee, um, it, it's really hard for the average Vermonter to figure out if they're um, if all the items in the workforce plan um, are truly uh, funded. So hopefully we can get that update and uh, learn from that. Um, I also had a note that um, uh, another board member would like to say some comments. Jess? Oh, well, sure. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted, I, in some ways, I just wanted to echo what you had said, Kevin, about how important it is to acknowledge, you know, the unprecedented strain that our hospitals are under. People have been working tirelessly for two years to keep Vermonters safe and healthy. I think we're all grateful. And I just wanted to comment on that and just say that today's discussion really in no way minimizes that hard work and dedication. It's really an effort to ensure that we have a robust hospital system in the future. The Vermonters can access care at low cost and high quality. And, you know, these conversations are, this is a start of conversations. There's some of them may be challenging. Um, but today is about reflecting on what we've learned and outlining an inclusive process that brings us closer to that system. And I think some folks have questioned why we're taking up the discussions now in the midst of a pandemic. And I think, you know, in my answer to that is to the degree that we need federal exemptions or funding to facilitate those conversations, to provide technical and transformational assistance to hospitals. You know, there's a lot of transformation dollars on the table right now. Do we need transportation dollars to better ensure access? Effectively, in my mind, those conversations need to have to start now while the legislature is still in session, while federal money is on the table and while we're developing proposals for the new federal agreement. So my concern is that if we wait, we may lose access to those funds, access to those exemptions that would actually ease the transition to that optimal system that we're trying to get. So in my mind, that's why we're having the conversation now. Um, that's what I want to say. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. So uh, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, um, January 12th. Is there a, a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 12th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. So next we are going to turn to the conversation of the um, integration of the 2021 uh, reports, the data and the feedback on the uh, healthcare reform leaders discussion um, that has been held. And um, I understand that due to time constraints, we're going to um, Call on Mike Barber first, and then we'll hear from Elena Barabee. So, Mike. Good afternoon. Can you see the the slides? We can. It's an interesting uh, layout too. Not one that I've seen before. I don't uh, know if you can enlarge that, um, Mike Barber. Better. There you go. Okay. I'm not used to this. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you taking me first um, so I can go pick up my kids. Uh, and I'm probably not going to set this up as well as Elena could, but um, you know, basically we thought that you would appreciate having a refresher on the board's uh, authorities as you begin to consider and discuss how to incorporate um, data or findings from the sustainability planning work. And so that's that's what I'm here to do. Um, and it's 
it's going to be pretty dry. I apologize, but um, I wanted to start out with some just just basic legal principles. Um, the first of which is that uh, agencies have only the authorities that the legislature has given them. Authorities can be either express or implied. Express authorities are exactly what they sound like. They're the authorities that the legislature has expressly granted to an agency. Implied authorities are authorities that um, are implied as necessary for an agency to fully exercise its express powers. Um, second, to determine the scope of an agency's authority, courts look to the agency's enabling legislation and seek to give effect to the legislature's intent. Uh, and then third, um, depending on the authority given to it by statute, an agency can exercise judicial or legislative functions or both. Uh, the judicial function is exercised through adjudication, which typically operates upon specific individuals based on present or past situations, whereas the legislative function is typically exercised through rulemaking and it operates uh, generally on a broad class of future situations. And as you're aware, the, let the, the board exercises both judicial and legislative authorities. Um, before I get into uh, authorities or, or duties, um, I wanted to, to note that the legislature has directed the board to execute um, pretty much all of its duties consistent with a series of uh, healthcare reform principles. To be clear, this is not a, a grant of authority, um, but it is relevant to what the legislature intended um, by giving the board its authorities. And so I wanted to, to just mention it here. Um, the principles uh, for healthcare reform are broad. I have attempted to um, distill some of the ones that are maybe more relevant to this discussion, um, but if you want to you know, take a look at the actual language. Uh, I've given you the statutory citation there. Um, as you would expect, uh, the the principles are are generally consistent with the purpose of the board, which is, uh, as you know, to improve the health of the population, reduce the per capita rate of growth in healthcare expenditures, while ensuring access and quality are not compromised, to enhance patient and healthcare professional experience of care to recruit uh, and retain high quality healthcare professionals and to achieve um, administrative simplification in healthcare financing and delivery. Um, I'll spend just, just a minute on this concept of a implied authority. It, it's of, of the two types of authorities, it's the harder of the two to talk about because there's not a list <laughs> anywhere that I can like run through with you. Um, but I did think it would be helpful to just review uh, a couple cases where where implied authority was found and not found to exist to help to help make it a little bit more concrete. Um, so in the two cases cited here, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court held that the board and its predecessor had the implied authority to clarify a certificate of need uh, that had already been granted. Um, as you know, the CON statutes require an applicant to notify the board prior to making any changes <clears throat> to an approved project, project, and they authorize the board to review such changes. And so the court looked at the statute and reasoned that, well, the board needs to be able to clarify the scope of a CON to determine if a proposed action is, is within the scope of the project that was approved or, or whether it's a change to the project. Um, and then contrast that uh, with this case, um, or these two cases rather, where the court held that the Commissioner of Banking and Insurance did not have the implied authority to order uh, health insurers to take um, certain actions in connection with a, a rate review decision. The statute at issue uh, required an insurer to obtain a permit prior, prior to entering a contract with a subscriber 
and it allowed the commissioner to refuse to issue a permit if the rates submitted were excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. And in connection with, uh, with one of these decisions, the commissioner had ordered an insurer to take take certain actions, for example, eliminate certain coverage clauses, report on prospective reimbursement, and reject cost increases from providers until they were adjusted to the lowest reasonable level. And the court um, held that the commissioner lacked the authority to issue these orders because nothing in the statutes or the case law could reasonably be construed as expanding the passive power of approval or disapproval of a rate into the act of authority to issue um, supplemental orders. Um, I'll get to it kind of towards the end of the presentation, but this statute uh, was subsequently amended um, and there are some cases interpreting that, uh, that amended language. So moving on to <clears throat> the board's express authorities, uh, I am not going to try to cover them all, um, but I'm going to try to cover the ones that um, seem to be most relevant to uh, the sustainability work. Uh, and the one that's probably most relevant um, is the hospital uh, budget statutes authorities. Um, the primary authority here is the authority to establish a budget for each hospital. And as you think about how to incorporate sustainability data or findings into our processes, you'll want to consider who those processes impact and how. And so the group directly impacted by the hospital budget process has traditionally been the state's 14 general hospitals, community hospitals, um, however you wanna, however you wanna say it. Um, this is changing, however. Effective July 6, 2020, the hospital budget statutes uh, now apply to any hospital that is licensed in the state, except a hospital that is conducted, maintained, or operated by the state. So this effectively brings the Brattleboro retreat into the board's hospital budget review process, but not the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, which is obviously operated by the state and not the VA hospital, which is excluded from the licensing statutes. Um, we have until uh, the fiscal year 2024 budgets to, to fully bring them in, um, but that just to remind you that that is coming. Um, as far as how this process impacts hospitals, um, I don't need to tell you, but the board has historically limited hospitals net patient revenues and their ability to increase charges, uh, which impacts primarily commercial payers, although uh, maybe not as directly as we would hope. Um, the statute, I did just want to note, doesn't refer to revenues or charges. It just, like I said, calls on the board to establish a budget for each hospital. Um, the statute also says that hospital budgets established by the board must meet certain requirements. For example, the budgets must promote efficient and economic hospital operations. Um, the budgets must reasonably reflect a reduction in hospitals net revenue needs for non-Medicaid payers due to any anticipated increases in Medicaid, Medicare, or other public health care reimbursement programs or to any reductions in bad debt or charity care due to a reduction in the uninsured rate. So basically the reverse of the cost shift. So if you're going to get more Medicaid funds, um, Medicare reimbursement increases, that needs to uh, be reflected in the budget and the, and the charge increase. Um, and so in construing the, the board's authority here, uh, a court would, would look likely to these uh, requirements um, and for example, if, if the board found that a hospital had not appropriately accounted for Medicaid or Medicare reimbursement increases when it developed its budget, uh, the board could adjust the budget to account for that. You know, to me at least, that would be pretty clearly within the board's express authority to establish a budget. Um, and then the hospital budget, uh, 
excuse me, hospitals uh, must justify their budgets. Uh, another important thing to consider. <clears throat> um, besides the authority to establish budgets, the other major authority um, here is is kind of a legislative authority, and it's uh, the authority to define annual criteria for hospitals to meet, such as utilization and inflation benchmarks. Um, relatedly, the board's rules specify that the board will, on an annual basis, establish benchmarks for any indicators for use in preparing the upcoming year's budget. Uh, the rule is very broad in terms of uh, what the benchmarks may cover, and it specifically mentions cost and price indicators, access indicators, population health and quality indicators, profitability indicators, uh, and prior budget performance. The benchmarks uh, do need to be set annually <clears throat> and included in the annual reporting manual, but there is nothing preventing the board from uh, signaling its intent with respect to years beyond just the next budget year. So for example, by reference to a, like a long-term cost growth benchmark or something. Um, and then the rule says that the board may adjust uh, proposed budgets of hospitals that do not meet the benchmarks established by the board. Uh, the board has some other express authorities with respect to hospital budgets. Uh, they're probably less relevant to this discussion, but worth worth a mention. Um, the board has the authority to adopt rules, to adopt uniform formats for hospitals to report financial scope of services and utilization data, and the board has enforcement authorities to ensure compliance with um, the requirements of the statute and the board's orders. Uh, and to deal with non-compliance. Um, the board also has authority over accountable care organizations or ACOs. Um, setting aside the, the section of the statute that deals with certification, there are really two primary authorities here. Um, the first is uh, to adopt rules that establish standards and processes for reviewing, modifying, and approving ACO budgets. And the second is uh, to adopt rules that establish standards that the board deems necessary and appropriate to the operation and evaluation of ACOs, including solvency and ability to assume risk. <clears throat> As you know, an, an ACO is, a, is an organization of healthcare providers that agrees to be accountable for the quality, cost, and overall care of the patients assigned to it. And so this process directly impacts uh, not just the ACO, but the, but the providers in it. Um, the board has adopted a rule, Rule 5, which specifies that the board may, as in the hospital budget review process, establish benchmarks uh, to be used by ACOs in preparing their budgets. And the rule also specifies that the board will establish a budget for the ACO by written order. Um, the statute lists 16 factors for the board to consider in reviewing, modifying, and approving an ACO's budget. For ACOs with 10,000 or more attributed lives, these factors are mandatory and must be considered for ACOs with less than 10,000 attributed lives, the factors are discretionary and the board may consider as many of them as it deems appropriate to the ACO's size and scope. The factors cover, um, for example, the extent to which the ACO provides uh, incentives for investments that strengthen primary care, um, integration of community-based providers into the care model, um, and investments in social determinants of health. And so I think partly because of that uh, kind of focus, the ACO budget process has um, focused to a greater degree on, on expenses than, than the hospital budget process. So what is, what is the ACO investing in um, 
uh, is a big is a big part of that. <clears throat> In addition to the statutory factors, uh, the rule specifies that the board will consider any benchmarks it has established. Um, the elements of the ACO's payer programs and any applicable requirements of the all payer model statute or the all payer model agreement. Uh, and then any issues, other issues at the board's discretion. And then like the hospital budget rule, the ACO budget rule says that ACOs must justify their proposed budgets. So Robin, you were correct <laughs> to mention that the other meeting. Uh, with respect to budgets of risk bearing ACOs, the rule says that the board will approve a maximum amount of risk that the ACO can assume as part of its budget. Um, and then like the hospital budget rule, there are enforcement authorities. Um, so for example, the board can review an ACO's performance under its budget at any time, such reviews don't need to be limited to financial performance. They can cover any matter approved by the board as part of the ACO's budget. And uh, the board can take remedial actions against an ACO that's uh, failing to meet the requirements of an order. Um, remedial actions can include monitoring or auditing plans, corrective action plans, things like that. Uh, Moving on to the board's rate review authorities. Uh, the board has the authority to review and either approve, modify, or disapprove rates for major medical health insurance policies. In terms of impact, um, as you know, this, this applies to individual, small group, and large group plans and fully insured uh, association health plans. This is a relatively small and shrinking segment of the overall health insurance landscape in Vermont. And another dynamic um, to maybe be aware of or consider is, is that you know, with the individual and small group plans, the board approves uh, the premiums that people pay, uh, whereas with the large group plans, the board approves the formula and factors that will be used to develop the premiums. The premiums for large group plans are not uniform. They vary by group and they depend on the experience of each group. Uh, and then in deciding whether to approve, modify or disapprove a rate, uh, the board is charged with determining whether the rate is affordable promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law. Uh, the board will also determine whether a rate is excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. The board is supposed to consider changes in health care delivery, changes in payment methods and amounts, and the Department of Financial Regulation's opinion regarding the impact of the proposed rate on the insurer's solvency and reserves. I mentioned on an earlier slide that, um, you know, back in the mid 1970s, the Vermont Supreme Court construed a, a statute that's was very similar to the board's rate review statute and held that it didn't authorize the commissioner of banking and insurance to order an insurer to take certain specific actions. Um, in response to those decisions, however, the legislature gave the commissioner this authority, <clears throat> uh, at least with respect to um, nonprofit hospital and medical service corporations such as Blue Cross and uh, HMOs such as MVP. This authority has been extended to the board as well. Uh, and so the board has <clears throat> the authority to issue supplemental orders and attach reasonable conditions and limitations to such orders, um, provided it is found based on competent and substantial evidence that the orders and conditions are necessary to ensure that benefits and services are provided at minimum cost 
under efficient and economical management. Um, the statutes specify that the board may not set payment or reimbursement rates through these supplemental orders, except as provided by um, 18 VSA 9375 and 9376. And I'll cover those statutes in a minute, but um, generally they authorize the board to implement by rule payment reform and cost containment methodologies um, such as global budgets or risk adjusted capitated payments uh, and to set reasonable reimbursement rates for providers based on those methodologies. So sticking with the uh, supplemental order authority here for a second, um, there is some, some case law interpreting this authority <clears throat> that's worth mentioning. Um, so in this case from uh, 1984, the uh, kind of the, what happened was the, the Commissioner of Banking and Insurance um, denied Blue Cross's request for a 30% rate increase and issued uh, four supplemental orders, one of which was aimed at reforming um, Blue Cross's hospital contracts. Um, I won't cover all the details of it, but it's kind of there on the slide. Uh, the court upheld the commissioner's authority to, to do that, um, noting that the statute had been changed since the last uh, decision. Um, the court noted that the authority had been given to the commissioner to ensure that benefits and services are provided at minimum cost and hospital costs are a significant component of um, health care expenditures. Uh, the court wrote that if the commissioner didn't have the authority to uh, order Blue Cross, Blue Cross to reform its contracts, he would be in an untenable position of being required to ensure that subscriber rates were not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory, and that rates, uh, excuse me, and that benefits and services were being provided at minimum cost, but he wouldn't have the means to actively bring that about. Uh, the second case uh, is from 1990, um, and it, it dealt with a, a supplemental order aimed at Blue Cross's administrative expenses. Um, I, won't, I won't talk about it much. It doesn't really add, add too much in terms of um, interpreting kind of the authority under the statute. It is, it is interesting in, in its discussion of due process. Um, Essentially, the court uh, analyzed whether um, the subject matter of the supplemental orders had been effectively communicated to Blue Cross so that it so that Blue Cross had a, a fair opportunity to respond to and offer objections. Um, but in terms of authority, it, it doesn't add too much. Um, Moving on from uh, rate review, <clears throat> the board has uh, a duty to oversee the development and implementation of healthcare payment and delivery system reforms and to evaluate the, the effectiveness of those reforms. And in connection with that duty, the board has a duty to implement <clears throat> by rule methodologies for achieving payment reform and containing costs that may include uh, the participation of Medicare and Medicaid. The statute lists uh, several types of uh, payment reform or cost containment methodologies that could be implemented by the board. They include healthcare professional <clears throat> cost containment targets, global payments, bundled payments, global budgets, risk adjusted capitated payments, <clears throat> or other uniform payment amount, payment methods and amounts for integrated delivery systems, healthcare professionals, or other provider arrangements. Um, just a note to note here that the statute uh, talks about how the board should develop these payment reform and cost containment methodologies. Uh, for example, the board <clears throat> must engage Vermonters and providers, and it must report its proposed methodologies to the um, 
health care committees in the legislature before it initially adopts them in a rule. The board also has rate setting authority. Uh, specifically, the board is directed to set reasonable rates for healthcare professionals and others based on uh, methodologies pursuant to the statute I, I just covered, 18 VSA 9375, in order um, <clears throat> to have consistent reimbursement amounts accepted by providers. Um, just a note here that while the board's rate setting authority is uh, connected to its authority to establish payment reform and, and cost containment methodologies, they are not the same thing. Um, for example, um, you know, the, the board could, like Rhode Island, um, establish a primary care spending target for health insurers uh, under its authority to establish payment reform and cost containment methodologies, but that would be different than, um, you know, directly setting rates for primary care providers under the board's rate setting authority. Um, you know, going to hospital global budgets, on the other hand, you know, depending on how you structure it, could, could implicate both the board's authority to implement payment reform methodologies and its authority to set payment rates. Uh, the legislative intent here uh, in giving the board this authority was to ensure that payments to healthcare professionals are consistent with efficiency, economy, and quality of care, and will permit them to provide on a solvent basis effective and efficient healthcare services that are in the public interest. Um, the legislature also said that it wanted to eliminate um, cost shifting between payers to ensure that the amount paid is sufficient to enlist enough providers to ensure that health services are available to all Vermonters and are distributed equitably. So these purposes, I think, um, tie in to, to a great extent with the issues you're, you're dealing with in terms of the sustainability planning. Uh, few other things to note about this statute. Uh, first, the board can uh, implement rate setting for different groups of healthcare professionals over time, so it can start with hospitals, for example. Um, second, uh, the board is supposed to approve payment methodologies that encourage cost containment, the provision of high quality evidence-based health services in an integrated setting, patient self-management, access to primary care, health services for underserved individuals, populations and areas, and healthy lifestyles. Um, so, you know, you'll obviously want to think about these uh, goals uh, and how they relate to, you know, any, any methodologies you consider, such as global hospital budgets. Um, and then finally, in establishing rates, uh, the board may consider legitimate differences <clears throat> in costs among healthcare professionals, such as the cost of providing specific necessary services or services that may not be available elsewhere in the state. Um, the, the need for healthcare professionals in particular areas of the state, uh, particularly underserved geographic or practice shortage areas. And then a, a pretty big caveat here uh, that um, all payer model, all payer methodologies, sorry, that are not currently authorized by the all payer model agreement um, could require federal waivers. So this is not certainly something I'm an expert in, but uh, you know, if you if you wanted, if you were going to set Medicare reimbursement rates, uh, there need to be multiple waivers of the IPPS, OPPS payment systems. Um, uh, in payment programs uh, from CMS. And if the board was going to set Medicaid rates, uh, that would also require waiver, I think, uh, at least of the single state agency requirements, among others. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what others, but um, just note that, that that is going to be needed if, if we're talking about all payer model methodologies. <clears throat> 
And then last but not least, uh, the sustainability work seems to implement implicate, sorry, the HRAP health resource allocation plan. Um, this is supposed to uh, identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources. And as you know, it's it's relevant to certificate of need program, but it's really supposed to be there to to inform the board's um, regulatory processes at large and its cost containment and reform initiatives, as well as any allocation of health resources within the state. So that is all I had. Happy to take questions. So since uh, we are on uh, um, uh, time schedule for Mike, I will uh, ask that we ask Mike the questions now and then we'll move to Elena after that. So does any member of the board have questions for Mike? I just have a, a quick one, which is I think it Mike, it might be helpful um, to just briefly note some of the authorities that we have, but which have not been implemented or used just to alleviate confusion between the statutory powers versus what's currently done. Sure. Um, oh, you guys disappeared. Uh, we certainly have not um, exercised our, our rate setting authority. Um, the payment, yeah, and the payment methodologies by rule. Um, I think Tom, I've heard loud and clear, particularly from Tom, but from other board members, the desire to uh, uh, require fixed perspective payments um, through rulemaking, and, and I'm working on that. Uh, but to date, we've not adopted a rule around that. Um, there are some other, frankly, authorities uh, <laughs> that the board has um, around quality that have not been um, exercised, uh, but I didn't cover those here, so I won't spend time on that. Thank you. Other comments or questions for Mike? OK, um, Mike, a, a question on uh, before you go. Um, would it uh, be necessary to open it up for public comment at this point or should uh, that be held to later? Um, I think it probably makes sense to hold it till later. It's all, uh, it's all kind of the same topic, I would say. And I'll, I'll be here until um, two fifteen, and then I just got to run for ten minutes, so I, I'll be around. Okay. I guess we were assuming Elena was going to go for a long period of time. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. At this point, we're going to turn it over to Elena. And, uh... OK, thank you. Um, so I apologize for any background noise. We are all in quarantine at my house. I will share my screen. Um, let me know if you can see that. I'm yes. OK, now I just have to find. All right, and I'm on the wrong slide. Okay, so um, I'm here to continue the conversation. Thank you, Michael Barber, for setting this up. Um, uh, first, you know, so this is really to synthesize what you've been hearing um, over the last number of years, really, and to think about paths forward and kind of agree on um, some key findings and key insights that could motivate how we can think about um, recommendations to the legislature, but also how to evolve um, the board's regulatory levers in a way that might help us get our arms um, more closely. I don't think the board has all the tools, but you know, how can we move more closely towards um, 
a more sustainable health system and, and for our hospitals. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the background, key findings, then path, uh, pass forward, and I'll pause for your feedback kind of throughout this presentation. A lot of the content, though, building up to the key findings should be familiar to you by now. Um, they've been presented in multiple forums. Some of it comes from our hospital budget process. Um, but this is really an opportunity for me to hear from you about what you think the priorities are and how we should kind of um, vision our next steps. So, and pause and ask questions, clarifications anytime. Um, so as a reminder, in 2019, the Green Mount Care Board required six of the 14 hospitals um, to participate in hospital sustainability planning, which at the time looked very different and was kind of a series of questions according to a framework for the hospitals to help us understand what they were doing about their um, sustainability challenge. As we dug into this more and COVID um, kind of came upon us, uh, you know, this change, and I think we recognize the systemic issues that were kind of bigger than what the hospitals could do and really required um, a different set of analyses. And I think it was one of, you know, when we had some of these early meetings with hospitals that, you know, they had articulated, hey, why don't you just start with the capacity analysis? You know, let us know what we're dealing with as a state. We don't operate in silos. We have, we share patients, we share, um, you know, bigger issues. So, that really um, got us thinking in a different way. And um, with COVID, you know, they, their bandwidth certainly shrunk um, as it should, so they could focus and prioritize, um, you know, patient care. Um, and we kind of followed up on that and, and did some, some preliminary analysis to get this going. Um, and then in 2020, uh, the legislature kind of, I think, shared some of the same concerns um, that the board had seen and codified this work into statute. Um, and asked us to consider ways to increase financial sustainability of Vermont hospitals, um, but also in the context of achieving population-based health improvements and maintaining um, community access to essential services. So, um, you know, I think that's where this affordability challenge comes into play that, you know, if we don't consider access and affordability, you know, these, these things could continue to get out of whack. So I'm just quick reminder of your homework this, and I think I mentioned this, um, you know, I'm hoping this will be more conversational. Um, I tried to put some links here to some of the previous resources, um, but would love to hear your insights on what you think, you know, how we should be framing these key findings. And if there are any that I've missed at the end, I would love to hear that. Um, and then recommendations. So, you know, we know that the hospitals have not been able to participate with us in, in a way that we can get to some concrete recommendations, but I think we can provide some guardrails and some um, kind of next steps in terms of a process for how we might get to this optimized um, vision, shared vision as a state. Um, and so, you know, what what can we do there, but also then looking within ourselves at the board, what can we be doing differently and how should we be evolving to make sure that um, we are robust to some of these issues as well. Okay, so I will dig in now. Um, so I, I did want to pause and, and talk again about COVID. You know, I think um, we do recognize the challenges that are ahead of us and, and the data that we have are only um, as good as, as, as they mean something going forward. And I think the best um, source of information we have for looking at long-term trends um, really go up to 2019. And, you know, we're still in the midst of this pandemic. This does not mean that our prior world um, will just somehow kind of turn back on and we will go back to it. But I think it it, it gives us an idea of trends and of um, longer term um, kind of knowledge of what's happening across the system. That doesn't mean that we won't need to update analyses as we go forward or as COVID and um, some of the utilization patterns kind of settle that we might not have things to learn. So I think we this is again an ongoing conversation, but for the purposes of um, what we're doing today, we've been looking predominantly at 2019 and prior. Okay. So this slide you should should be familiar with. Um, you know, rural hospital closure is is substantial. 181 hospitals have closed nationally since 2005, so this problem is not unique to Vermont. Um, and that rate of closure has only been increasing. And then certainly the pandemic. Um, you know, put a whole nother um, challenge to these issues. Um, and then, you know, 
what's really important to know is that the median overall profit margin is a, is a strong predictor of hospital closure. And that's, I think, what signaled a lot of alarm to board members and why you know, we're continuing to push to have this conversation now um, before we see continued um, challenges to the system. And hospital closures not only threaten patient access, but also materially affect the local economy. So, um, you know, if we do nothing, <laughs> we could see kind of a ripple effect of repercussions. Um, and then, you know, certainly there has been a canary in the coal mine, which we all know um, in the southern part of the state. Um, and we just want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So the growing challenges faced by rural hospitals is um, you know, not all of these are unique to Vermont, certainly, but declining populations, um, rising medical inflation, rising costs, workforce challenges, um, rural bypass for larger community hospitals or towards, you know, academic medical centers, um, aging plant, needed investments in population health under value-based care models. You know, these things aren't free, even though they'll have longer term payoffs, it takes money and, and resources to get that going. Uh, technological and clinical innovation requirements and managing a public health crisis is certainly a challenge that um, we're still all facing right now. So here is one of the earlier slides that you've seen, um, just very dramatic decline in, in margin, operating margin over the last five years. Um, in 2020, there were some federal funds that um, helped kind of stabilize um, though not a healthy system. Um, so, you know, we don't want to kind of return to where we were and to the trends that existed before the pandemic, which were largely um, based on kind of this fee for service and volume um, based model. And so how can we think about strengthening our system and ensuring that, you know, it's strong, capable and able to serve Vermonters to the best extent possible? forward. Um, the reason for this is, you know, revenues outpacing expenditures, or sorry, it would be nice, um, expenditures outpacing revenues. So costs are continuing to increase um, despite kind of reductions um, on, on the top line. So costs of labor and benefits are increasing, costs of supplies, pharmaceuticals, and then um, aging population in, is more expensive to care for um, individuals with greater chronic conditions. Um, and this is a system wide um, issue. So you'll see that largely most of our hospitals have experienced some kind of challenge over the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, this is compounding and expanding. And total margin looks better, um, but this is not a sustainable source of revenue. And so we really want to make sure that operationally that we are sound. Um, other operating revenue, I think this just speaks to the COVID relief funds um, and, and 340B is another um, example here. So, you know, where there are other ways that hospitals have cobbled together um, means to, to keep going, but, um, you know, that's not, again, that puts us in a precarious situation. Age of plant is a growing concern and is a real problem in some areas. So, um, you know, and this will only get worse if they can't maintain margins or they have very slim margins. Margins are not a bad thing. <laughs> we need to have a little wiggle room so that we can invest and that we can stay on top of, um, you know, advances in, in medicine and uh, making sure that we're delivering the best possible care. So why does this matter? Um, I think we'll speak I spoke to this a little bit and I'll continue to highlight why we need to continue down this path. Um, affordability, quality and access. You know, affordability in, in Vermont hospitals primary levers to increase operating margin um, is commercial price. Um, and this really only exacerbates affordability crisis because their government um, payments are largely stable. So if, if that doesn't kind of meet their needs, then um, the commercial price is where they have room to lean. Um, on the quality side, we know from the literature that hospitals in financial distress struggle to maintain quality and patient safety and often have worse patient outcomes relative to well-resourced hospitals. Uh, if we do nothing and hospitals continue to decline, we may see that bleed into some of our quality outcomes for Vermonters. And then access. Um, as I mentioned before, financial distress is a key predictor of hospital closure, which could leave some communities without access to care or would have to drive, um, you know, double or triple the time it takes um, to get to those services, which for emergent services is, you know, a, a big, a big problem. 
So key finding number one, I think, is just, you know, financial health of Vermont hospitals is assessed by operating margin, declined over the six recent fiscal years. Uh, this means that the cost of delivering care is increasing faster than payments to hospitals for providing services to patients. Left alone, this trend could lead to the erosion of service quality, reduced affordability, and or hospital closures. Uh, hospital closures compromise access to essential services and have been growing concern among rural hospitals across the U.S. Um, and while non-operating uh, revenue sources offer some relief, this is not sustainable. So I'll pause there for our first one. Hopefully this one isn't controversial, but I will open it up um, and see if, if you all have any thoughts. Hi, Elena. Um, <clears throat> One tension that I've I kind of noticed thinking about this is that um, it would that that there, there's a timeline issue here that we might want to consider. That you know, yes, in as we uh, struggle with the pandemic, that's a near-term issue. As we deal with Medicare on reconcilable um, uh, FPPs, that's another timeline um, a few years down the line. Um, at the end of the, say, the all-pair model number two, um, we might be down out at 2028, and by then people might have process fatigue, which some folks have talked about. Um, and so I'm just wondering how, how we um, kind of put together a timeline that, uh, <clears throat> that, that kind of maybe um, projects out the trajectory, trajectories of stuff that we've already got in play um, and kind of think that through so that people kind of know where we are and know where we're going. Um, and is, is this going to be, I mean, Stroutwater recommended 2030, you know, as kind of the, the end date. I, to me personally, that seems too far out. Um, the end of all payer model two would be 2028. 20, uh, that still seems far out, but on the other hand, you know, we need to have the time up front for the hospitals to kind of get back to a stable situation. And that's something we don't control and we just have to wait until we get there. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, I'm not sure I have all the answers for you today, but I think that's something I could take back and work with directors and our other state partners on. Um, but I think, you know, getting to what we call the optimal, you know, I, I, that's a long lifelong journey. You know, I think there's a lot of learning. I don't think anyone has all the answers, but I think there's things that we can do now, um, things that we can do over the next couple of years and things that we can continue to work towards as a state. Um, but I agree that we need we need to establish that shared vision and that shared timeline um, and hold hold each other accountable to it. Um, I think the all payer model timeline is definitely one that needs to be considered in this work because uh, I think there's some opportunities there. Um, I think, but even in the next budget, the hospital budget cycle, there are probably some things that we can think about doing differently there. So um, I think, you know, I'll, for an official timeline, I think we can get back to you, but hopefully if you have thoughts on what what you think, um, I'm happy to take those well, back. Uh, the, 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 the major thought I have is, is what on the timeline do we not control? I mean, if you look at the trajectory of the trend on operating margins, you know, uh, that that trend line, including UVM Medical Center and without UVM Medical Center is uh, heading in the wrong direction. And and how long can it continue in that direction in another year, another two years, another three years? And at the same time, you know, the investments that we're trying to make to kind of reform the system are in play. And I, I just uh, um, I, I just I just think that that's that's something we don't control. And, and we really have to respond to and and, and respect. Um. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Anything else? I'll go ahead and jump in. I think uh, in response first to Tom's timeline um, question, I think when we get to next steps, um, it would be nice to think about that in relationship to the next steps, and, but it certainly makes sense to me to have you think about it on a bigger scale and come back with some ideas. Because I, I do think it's it's good to, to at least to identify, even if we don't feel like we can pick a timeline, but identify that that is clearly a next step 
um, and probably involves other stakeholders. Um, but in terms of this particular finding, um, I felt like it did a good job summarizing um, kind of what we've been talking about around and worrying about really with the hospital financial health. So I didn't have any specific adjustments um, or anything that I felt like was missing from this particular one. I'll, I'll just agree with that, with what Robin just said. Um, I thought the, the verbiage here was perfect. I think it summarizes exactly where what actually precipitated all of the sustainability planning efforts, the concerns we have. Um, and, you know, to me, I just I look at those those graphs that you presented, Elena, and it's just so deeply troubling to see those operating margins shrinking. I know you're going to get to this in a second, but cost coverage of public payers is part of that problem. Um, it's contributing to that. I also think, you know, we'll get, I know you're going to get to this, but reliance on fee-for-service is not sustainable in communities that have declining populations and where care is being moved out of the hospitals into the outpatient settings. You can't rely on volume to cover fixed costs if the volume is shrinking. So, you know, I think you're going to get to some of those solutions, but, um, I, you know, left alone, we're in trouble. So I think this is an excellent key finding and uh, the sense of urgency is there. Helena, this is Tom Walsh. Um, I just echo the, my fellow board members. I mean, this key finding really highlights the need to not stand still. We're in a crisis, but there was a crisis brewing before the pandemic. And um, standing still, um, letting one crisis unfold and another not addressing the other, I think is um, would not be a good move. Um, so I appreciate the effort that you've put forth in kind of developing the why behind all of this and um, why we need to be moving forward now. Okay. I would just say ditto, Elena. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't expect if you don't have, you know, we don't have to do a full round but this is great this is thank you all um for the thoughts and the feedback um okay so we have 63 slides i'm gonna try to not make it a two-hour presentation but um this is important okay so prices vary by hospital payer and setting um so this should look familiar to you or some um, analyses that burns and hma uh, put together for us not too long ago um, looking at hospital um, specific uh, price variation. Um, and so they grouped it by uh, kind of critical access, CAH is critical access hospital, um, PPS hospitals, so those um, medium-sized hospitals and then academic medical centers. And you can see that there's, you know, quite a bit of variation across. So the left is inpatient, if it's very small writing, the right is outpatient. Um, and so, you know, this even after adjusting for case mix, this variation is quite persistent. Um, and this, you know, means that there's different kind of bargaining power, I think, across hospitals, or could mean, you know, as one one um, explanation, different bargaining power across hospitals and their ability to um, drive prices. And then we know that costs vary. So um, this could also, there are a number of explanations here, but there's variation in hospitals to deliver certain, um, or pack, this is an aggregate level, so a certain package of services um, more or less efficiently than others. Um, and then there, this is cost coverage by hospital, by payer and care setting, so inpatient or outpatient. And so a couple of things you'll notice here is that um, for government payers, those generally less able, so the red is um, below 85% cost coverage. The gray is, you know, around, um, you know, 95 to 105% of cost coverage. That means like your, the cost and the and the price are a, a roughly equivalent. And then the green is um, higher revenue than than cost, so higher price than cost. So that's around 100 over 115%. Um, so commercial, you'll see, is more likely, particularly in outpatient setting, to co be to cover the cost of delivering care. Um, but commercial inpatient, you'll just see on the whole, inpatient is a little rockier of a setting than outpatient. Um, but that there is certainly a shift 
um, inability of um, hospitals to cover their costs depending on the, the payer. Um, and so, you know, and this varies by service category. So depending on what um, services hospitals offer, you know, this will affect their um, kind of cost model. And this, and particular some services, while they're, you know, on the whole, um, you know, more likely to have a higher price if, you know, for a for a commercial patient. Um, sometimes that that in some cases does invert. The, the key finding here um, is that there's significant variation across hospitals in the extent to which reimbursements cover the costs of delivering a particular service, even after controlling for case mix. And this varies by payer and care setting, so inpatient and outpatient. Um, and these variations could be driven by relative efficiency or pricing strategy, which are, or likely both. You know, these things are not mutually exclusive. Um, commercial payments are higher than governmental payments for similar services, and often governmental payments are insufficient to cover the current cost of delivering many services to patients. Um, this disadvantages those hospitals and populations that serve a higher proportion of patients that are insured by government payers, which are often those patients with greater social and physical health needs. So I'll pause there for thoughts and feedback. Helena, this is Tom Walsh. Um, when you're talking about cost coverage, could you tell me a little bit more? Is the the cost figure is that what um, the delivery system is charging? Is that the base number that we're comparing to? So the cost, no, so um, the cost is based on the claims data. So I think we use the Medicare cost reports, and then there was a method used to to take that um, allocation method and apply it to the other um, the other payers. So it is a, an estimate of costs. It's not perfect. We do not have cost accounting systems in all of our hospitals. Um, that would be nice, but that would be in another administrative burden. Um, Anyway, yeah, so it is it is an estimate of cost. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. <laughs> it's an important it's an important point that um, the, the language becomes important as we're trying to build shared knowledge and shared understanding across a state, really. But um, if I'm in private practice as a physical therapist and I have a treatment that I charge a hundred dollars for, and government payments pay me $85, that's a 15% loss, right? A $15, they're covering 85%. But that $100 um, isn't really my cost of doing care. It's what I charge. It doesn't reflect fully the direct and indirect costs, the fixed and variable costs associated with the time and the people and the activities that they're doing. And so it's important in, in my experience across multiple um, healthcare delivery systems, it's important that we get to some shared understanding of the limitations of these words. And that's just an important thing that as we move forward, I believe we'll have to spend a good deal of time developing shared language and shared knowledge to get to some shared understanding between and amongst ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. That's an excellent point. So I, I can um, maybe if I weave in some of the definitions here of of how we approached cost and price in the analyses that we're leaning on, um, maybe that would help. Yeah, I, I think it would. And it, there's a risk, of course, you know, of going too deep uh, with how those how uh, Medicare estimates it, the cost of care. Um, but at least among the board, I think that that'd be good for us to dive into a bit deeper. I, I, I think the reliance on assuming a charge is the same as a cost can be a roadblock to reform efforts. If we believe that what I'm charging is my cost, anytime there's a payment to me under my charge, it will feel to me like a threat and a loss and can be perceived as that. But if my actual cost of doing the time and the activities to deliver the care, I can get that below what I'm reimbursed, even if my charge is um, different. 
they're they're di they're different things. Yes. Cost and charge are different things, but we use the terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important point and um, you're going to see in your first hospital budget process this summer, Tom, that um, some frustration because um, when you're setting a change in charge, um, one hospital might be reimbursed 85 percent, another one um, 80 percent, another one 89 percent of their charges. So you're really not seeing what the actual reimbursements are. And um, I would just say that um, in conjunction with this key finding, um, the, the more fundamental question in my mind is, can the cost be reduced through efficiency? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Mullen. And in, in, in my experience, there are techniques, there are uh, skills, principles, practices, software that can help with that, um, but they're not free. And it, it, to say that everybody should start doing those things now would not be sensitive to the operations that are happening around us. But um, to start, I think building the shared language and shared knowledge is your example was spot on, but it's even worse, right? Those numbers that you just provided can be in the same facility for the same service, just with different reimbursement. Depends on the, the negotiation between the provider and the payer. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I think your point's well taken that, um, you know, despite the definitions, costs are not fixed. And that I think that's kind of why we have healthcare reform to think about whether and when costs of delivering healthcare or the spending in general. So like, is utilization appropriate, which we'll get to. Um, but I think that is something that um, as a state, we need to kind of have some, like you said, clear definitions and that will help us move towards that vision. Thank you. I think just to, to build on that a little bit, um, I think, you know, to Tom's point, it would be helpful in the report to p give definitions, as you mentioned, Elena. I think uh, the prices and the payments were taken from claims data, what the hospitals were reimbursed by the insurers. Uh, the cost data was taken from the Medicare cost reports. This is what the hospitals self-reported their costs were. And then the charges were taken from the charge master of those hospitals. So those are the three definitions that were used in the analyses that HMA Burns uh, provided to us. And so maybe it'd be helpful to just clarify, there is a, we, we use the terms, you know, payment, charge, and cost very specifically in these analyses. Um, and so for me, maybe just to build on that, where I found these analyses incredibly helpful uh, to my understanding and uh, frankly it raised a lot more questions <laughs> it gave me some understanding but it gave, raised a lot more questions there was wide variation in payments they weren't always tied to underlying costs reported by the hospitals um, for those services and uh, you know in many cases you would see wide variation in average costs um, of providing those services uh, so I think, you know, we, I think we need to understand it better. This is the first look at this HMA analysis. So one possible takeaway that I have for other board members and maybe our data and hospital budget teams to consider is how might we incorporate price and cost and cost coverage analyses like this in our processes going forward, specifically in our hospital budget process, but also maybe in our rate review process. Um, and also, you know, one of the things that the consultants did not do is they didn't look at reimbursements for professional services. So should be we looking at that as well um, in our future analyses. So I will, you know, leave that for our data and hospital budget teams to consider. At the very least, one of the key takeaways that I came up with was I think we may want to separately evaluate commercial rate requests of hospitals for inpatient, outpatient and professional services separately. So. I learned a lot from looking at this and there's huge variation. Um, like I think, for example, one of the takeaways for me was smaller hospitals are actually getting higher reimbursements for outpatient care than even the academic medical centers. That surprised me. It may surprise communities um, that they're paying more for outpatient services in their local communities than elsewhere. Um, there's lots of, you know, uh, perceptions about out there about where are the highest prices and at least on the outpatient side, the highest prices were in some of the smaller communities. Um, 
And so I think we just need to understand that a little bit better. And I also think in terms of the cost coverage data that was provided by HMA Burns, the evidence was striking. It's not new, but it's when you see all of that red on those charts, you know, it's very clear that neither Medicaid nor Medicare are covering the cost of delivering care to their patients. And if the Medicaid and Medicare patient populations continue to grow, which we're seeing, and our commercial populations continue to shrink, and if the public payers fail to keep up with inflation, some of our most vulnerable communities are going to lose access to essential services. Um, so I think, you know, the takeaways for me as we go forward are thinking about we need to explore ways to address Medicare shrinking cost coverage in the next federal agreement, if that's a possibility, at least it should be on the table to be thinking about. And I think we may want to discuss as a board whether we want to, uh, you know, add to the February 1st report to the legislature a discussion of the impact that Medicaid shrinking cost coverage has on hospital sustainability. There's a role to play here for the legislature. And if Medicaid reimbursements don't at least keep pace with inflation, then there's going to be implications for hospital solvency, access, and quality of care. So those were some of my takeaways from um, from the data that you just presented and some of the you know information that we've heard related to key finding number two. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, uh, as quick as I can, add, add to that. I, um, I'm a, you know, been very critical of the cost shift and thinking that um, the cost shift could not, uh, in our annual report that we just issued, the cost shift prior through 19, 20, through 2019 has been growing at 9.1%. And if that is truly the cost shift, i.e. Um, Medicaid, not covering costs at a growth rate of 9.1%, um, that could be fatal. But then uh, during uh, the hearings that we had uh, with the consultants, you know, I raised the issue of the cost shift and the consultant said, well, the cost shift isn't what you think. It's really the market power of the hospitals relative to the commercial folks. And, uh, and, and it, so it's not, it's not a cost shift, it's, it's, the, it's hospitals using their market power to get more out of the commercial folks. And that may be true or may not be true, I don't know, but I, I just think it's important that um, on price and cost, we dig deeper to come to a truly consensus understanding um, of, of what's what. And I, I think Tom's point is a very valuable point. Um, and and I, I think that that's an area where we, we, we don't do our data well. You know, we, we uh, price variation, et cetera, we don't do that well. And I think that is an area that we have to pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah, thank you both. I've, I've made notes. <laughs> Anyone else on this one? Okay. So charges first payments. So this was out of the, the same analysis. Um, and this just showed that there was not a one to one correlation between charges and payments. Um, and so what this means for staff key finding number three, um, to your point, I <laughs> think we talked about the definition, so I won't spend much time there. But um, in Vermont hospital prices are regulated through um, the board's review and approval of hospitals commercial change in charge. Um, in the hospital budget review process. Um, however, changes to a hospital's charge master is not the best way to influence the net payment received and to address affordability. So I'll pause there for thoughts or feedback on the language. This is Robin. Um, I thought this did a good job as uh, I frequently say in our meetings, when I think about the hospital budget process, I think of it as uh, a sledgehammer, not a scalpel, and that's particularly true when we're setting the charge, uh, the charge increases. So I do think this is an area that it would be good to think about um, for future hospital budget processes, how we can uh, move forward with a more nuanced approach um, to make it more effective. Yeah, I guess I'll just add there. It's you know it's clear from that data that we that Burns presented that the relationship between charges and payments is weak, and it's especially weak for outpatient care, uh, which seems to be you know as we know uh, an increasing share of hospital revenues. So 
I guess I would, you know, ask again for the data team and the hospital budget team to work together to help us think about how we might use some of this price and cost analysis to make more informed hospital budget decisions going forward. You know, what would be a better lever if change in charge is a weak instrument? What would be a better way to, to make more informed hospital budget decisions? <clears throat> Hi, Elaine. It's, it's Tom Walsh again. I just I'd add to that that in addition to the um, the price reimbursement cost those those definitions and we're ha and when we are having our budget team look at that the other piece we have to be looking at is just utilization rates right because if i cap if i um i'll go back to the example of me in private practice if i charge a hundred dollars for my service and the reimbursement gets capped at $90, and I feel that I'm always losing, right? The way that I would try to survive is to see more people, right? And if my schedule is already full, then I'll feel like there's a workforce shortage. I don't have enough people, right? And so these issues are interconnected. And when, we're, when we talk about um, putting a cap on a charge or a price, um, the variability that that your the data have shown so far, that variation will just reappear in utilization records, and so you, you have to watch both because it becomes a an issue like pushing on a balloon, right? It just bulges in another place. Um, the third thing that we'll need to design systems to be able to look at of course, are, are going to be the outcomes that are produced. Because if we're trying to lower prices or control prices and monitor utilization, um, we've got to make sure that people are still getting the health care they need and they're healthy. Thank you. And I think um, I don't want to, well, spoiler alert, you know, I think part of the problem is the fee-for-service structure, which which is creating all of these dynamics that you're describing that, you know, my rate isn't enough. I need to bring in more volume. Oh, I don't have enough people to service this volume. And it's just this cycle. Right. And I think, you know, part of this is, you know, if we can get to global budgets, might that alleviate not only the financial constraints, but also the volume constraints and allow providers to really focusing on the right care, the right time, the right setting. <laughs> um, well you know, so that's something I, I hope you all will keep in mind as we go through this presentation, but, um, you know, we'll get there. But I think that's a very good point that in our current environment, you can't just look at cost price, that we also have to think about how this affects utilization and, and ultimately Vermonters uh, health outcomes. Okay, I'm going on. All right. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully we won't have to spend much time here, but the levers um, that hospitals have in our current um, structured environment are um, to increase commercial prices, reduce operational costs, and increase volume. So I think, um, Tom uh, Walsh, you just did a great job describing those levers um, in the current <laughs> the current situation. Um, so, you know, this puts, there's this tension, right, between um, hospitals and, and using those levers and the affordability of healthcare to Vermonters. So hospitals have to increase commercial rates. Um, you know that doesn't come without an offset to um, what Vermonters feel in terms of their premiums. Um, what employers have to take out of their paychecks to pay for that that care. Um, and so it, it doesn't just come out of thin air that these are real costs, even though they may not be an official tax. Um, it is a tax to the system and to Vermonters. Um, and we know that this is being felt um, on the ground already. This was in 2018. I think this is a um, AHS's household health insurance survey. Um, you know, so more than a quarter of those are uninsured, um, who are uninsured work for an employer who offers health insurance. Um, a large proportion of, of these people indicate that cost is either the only reason or one of the main reasons that they do not have health insurance. Um, not being on the state insurance anymore. I can tell you for a small Vermont company that my husband works for, this is a real problem and has been a problem, you know, personally. Um, overall, more than a third of Vermonters under the age of 65 are underinsured. 
Um, and among those who have private health insurance, 40% can be considered underinsured. Um, and the proportion of Vermonters younger than 65 who have private health insurance are underinsured, um, and that's increased um, from 2014 um, when it was 27%. So, <clears throat> you know, this is this is a real problem, and it and it's affecting Vermonters. And it, again, if left alone, this will only get worse. Um, so, you know, I've seen it in premium rate growth. I you know, I think the 2022 is, is a little misleading, but um, all the years prior to that, you know, we were seeing upwards of <laughs> double digit increases, which is nowhere close to inflation. Um, you know, and these are real, real um, charges or sorry, shouldn't use that word. Real, um, these are felt by Vermonters in terms of what comes out of their pocket. And then we've seen it in the hospital budget process. These are the commercial charges increase year over year from 2017 to 2021. Um, and so, you know, the commercial rate increases increases not only lead to higher premiums, making private health insurance less and less affordable for Vermonters, um, but this pool, this commercial pool is, has been shrinking in Vermont. So that means that the number of Vermonters who are expected to shoulder these increasing increases is, is smaller. And so those increases will have to be higher and higher in order to make those gaps. And at some point, it may not be sufficient to keep hospitals afloat. So um, between 2013 and 2019, the Medicaid and Medicare populations grew compared to the privately insured. Um, so the staff key finding here, uh, the magnitude and growth of commercial rates has created significant affordability problems for employers and for Vermont residents with employer-based coverage. Continuing to rely on this mechanism will only exacerbate the affordability crisis, potentially compromising access to care of the commercially insured as care becomes increasingly cost prohibitive. Uh, further, commercial rate increases are an unsustainable lever to address hospital financial health. Um, and due to declining commercial population in Vermont, and at some point may be insufficient to keep hospitals open, another risk to Vermonters continued access to essential services. So I'll pause there. So Elena, one statistic that I noticed during going through the ACO budget process was looking at the rate of growth. Um, I think it was 22 over projected 21 of the kind of fee for service payments versus the fixed prospective payments. And um, so, so the fee, the fic, fee for service payments as a, as a total were uh, growing at an 11.6% rate year over year. And the um, fixed prospective payments that went through the ACO were growing at 9.5% a year. I mean, that's a small percentage, but it's a 22% difference. And so, yeah, so even within the ACO, uh, we've we kind of lost some ground to fee for service. And I just, I, I'm not asking that. I just make that point because time is somewhat of the essence here. Um, and even though, even though both fee for service and FPP grew, fee for service grew faster than FPP. And for us to kind of, I would think, be able to say that things are going in the right direction, it, that that would be the other way around. That uh, fixed prospective payments would be growing at a faster rate than fee for service. Just an observation. Yeah, thank you. And just as a reminder, I mean, I think the board should know this, but that ACO and hospital budgets overlap, but are not concentric circles. Yeah. Oh, and I'll just say I agree with this finding. So I think the the way it's outlined is exactly what I believe is actually happening. So okay, thank you. Okay, um, we will move to the next one. So I think we can all agree that commercial prices are not the way to solve this problem. Um, so what about reducing operational costs? I think we've touched on this a little bit. Um, so we hear from hospitals all the time about, you know, we've cut, we've cut, you know, there's nothing left to cut, um, you know, and change is hard, <laughs> not just change is hard, but sometimes if you're so small, there's not really a whole lot of room to cut. So a few reasons for these challenges, you know, small rural hospitals struggle, struggle to cover the fixed costs of running a hospital. Um, recruitment challenges are also a problem and lead to higher staffing costs. So um, as a reminder, the majority of a hospital's budget is, is for its people. 
Um, so that becomes extremely costly, particularly as there's this shift to travelers um, and, and, you know, d different staff can demand higher wages um, and then lower volumes. So you have fewer people coming in the door. Um, and this is the same problem I think we've been describing in the fee for service environment. Um, so these challenges will only worsen as plant ages and capital investment becomes more expensive. Workforce shortages put higher pressure on wages and volumes shrink due to declining populations and, you know, the shifts away from inpatient care. So um, I hope I'm not repeating myself. I just want to make sure we're all very clear about the dynamics that we're, we're witnessing. Um, and then, so according to the Berkeley Research Group's analysis, um, small Vermont hospitals face low occupancy rates pre-COVID. Um, some hospitals may face excessive um, or excess capacity in the future, uh, particularly given Dartmouth's expansion um, and our population decline, um, though other hospitals may need expanded capacity due to population growth. So this is not, you know, one you know, one trend across the state that depending on what community you're in, um, these dynamics may look a little bit different. Um, so the low volumes in certain services may increase costs and compromise quality. Um, we know that particularly for some low volume services, um, there are concerns about, you know, how, how many services you need to be delivering to ensure a certain threshold of quality. Um, and centers of excellence may be a path forward um, to think about efficiency, financial sustainability, and high quality care. So the staff key finding here, um, you know, while improving hospital operational efficiency is necessary and important for minimizing healthcare spending waste and improving quality, um, focusing within a hospital alone is unlikely to solve the issue of financial sustainability due to the small size of many hospitals um, in Vermont and other rural areas um, and relatively high fixed costs. Um, thus, any significant opportunities to increase efficiency will require streamlining operations. Um, so we could think about the centers of excellence recommendation, for example, and eliminating duplicative services across the entire system of inpatient outpatient care. And I, before I pause here, and maybe I should have written it in the finding, this is not saying that this, the board shall <laughs> determine how this is done. This is simply saying that as a state, if we're serious about looking at operational costs and rethinking and reshaping the cost of healthcare, um, that these are things that we will need to think about as a state. So I don't want anyone to come away with this key findings with the idea that I'm suggesting the board do anything at this time. This is just stating the problem um, for, for the state to think about how to solve. So thank you. Any feedback? So I may be reacting to the concept of operational efficiency um, as it's used here, but I, what I struggle with with this finding is that there is a balance between the, the system-wide um, data and information and then how change actually happens, which requires that to happen not at the state level, but at individual provider levels, right? So uh, I think what what we're trying to say here is that hospitals, and I think we did hear this from the hospitals, they're not going to be able to cut their way out of the problem. Um, but I do think, and, and so maybe it, it, it's just a matter of being a little more clear that that's, that that that's what the first clause is implying, that the hospitals can't just cut their way out um, and that something more transformative operationally would need to happen. Um, but for me, that this sort of minimizes, this the way the finding strikes me, and it may just be me, is that it kind of minimizes the amount of work that has to happen at the individual provider level to make, um, the change because even if you're looking at a center of excellence like there's that from that flows a billion operational changes that would have to happen at multiple places right so um i i don't have specific language suggestions but i just there i think there needs to be a little bit of tweaking here to kind of balance that a little more it for in my opinion other people may disagree with me 
you know, I, 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 I can see that. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Right, because I think, so what the example I would give is, um, you know, one way to reduce cost is to get all your orthopedic surgeons to agree to use the same joint, right? And that is, sounds like it should be super easy, but it's actually an incredibly difficult, challenging uh, operational effort that would actually take way more time than many of us would think. Um, and that could have significant cost savings. It's probably not going to help if the hospital has consistently been in the red as the only initiative, right? Like it's not going to solve all the problem. It could help a little bit. So, and that may be, and, but I would say that getting that done is still very challenging potentially for a hospital to do depending on their culture and the physician leadership in that area. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. Any other thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> Elena, this is Tom Walsh again. Um, I, I think so far through through everything that you've presented, you've, you've done a nice job showing that um, we're facing systemic problems. And so a key insight with that is no one facility on its own can solve the systemic problems. It will take a systemic response. Yeah, no, I think I think that's what I was trying to convey. And I think Robin's point is a good one that we can't minimize the effort <laughs> that would be required in either situation on the part of the provider to, you know, innovate. Yeah. I think I was just thinking, can you flip to, to, to staff finding six, which is the next one? Because in some ways, I think maybe it's it's a matter of, if you speak about this in a second, then maybe I can, maybe it's a matter of combining five and six in some way. Yeah, maybe I'll read it and get your thoughts on this. So preliminary analyses suggest that absent COVID demands, Vermont's care delivery system is over capacity in some areas and under capacity in others. Several Vermont hospitals are operating at a very low occupancy, and some of these hospitals are located relatively close to one another. This suggests that despite demographic shifts over time, right-sizing of hospital infrastructure has not kept pace. Uh, projections of Vermont population demographics indicate that post-COVID, the mismatch between need and distribution of capacity across the state are expected to widen, um, absent any changes. Um, COVID has also revealed the need of health systems to pivot quickly to meet evolving patient needs, but also that maintaining costly excessive capacity is not necessary as hospitals have the ability to innovate in response to changing environments. Given these trends and lessons learned, there's an opportunity to strengthen Vermont's health system and rethink the structure of care delivery to ensure it is efficient, nimble, and innovative and prepared to serve Vermonters high quality, affordable care. So, um, I think you're right. I think this is speaks well with the last one as well. Yeah. Yeah, I almost, I mean, I kind of take, oh, sorry, was somebody else speaking? No, okay. I mean, I, I kind of take findings five and six together. And I think to Tom's point, together, taken together, the point is we need a systems approach to optimizing care delivery, right? And, and you know, let's be honest, this is where the conversations are gonna be the most challenging. And where we have to recognize that it's human nature to resist change, right? Uh, that's an emotional response, status quo bias. It's a preference for the status quo. And any change from the status quo is perceived as a loss. Um, but I, I guess I would say we're not winning right now. And many of our hospitals, as you've shown us, are, are struggling financially. Commercial rate growth is no longer going to be the backstop. Even if the board approved higher and higher commercial rates, there's not enough Vermonters to afford them. So that's not a sustainable path. And I guess when I think of these two key findings together, I think we know we can do better on cost, quality, and access. And if we were to take a whiteboard and draw the optimal hospital delivery system, I guess the question we should all ask is, would we end up with the delivery system that we have now? And if not, how do we get closer to the optimal delivery system that we might write on a whiteboard, right? And um, there's a lot of concern. We've been hearing about this on the news. It's the most pressing concern right now is our limited and shrinking healthcare workforce, right? So how do we deploy them in a way that's the most efficient and has the greatest impact on population health? That's part of that systems design. It's thinking about how do we, how do we design a system, our infrastructure, and how do we design a system that 
maximizes our workforce, which we know is going to be shrinking um, over time if we don't do something. And I think some of the questions that the hardest questions that have to be asked and answered are which services need to be available locally. And these are essential services that have to be available locally. And then other services that could be better delivered at a center of excellence, right? That's a, that's a set of questions that we need to answer as a state holistically together, inclusively, inclusive of communities, inclusive of providers, inclusive of the state. And, you know, to, to the point in here about the pandemic, the pandemic has taught us a lot, right? Technological innovation has showed us that we can meet people where they are through telemedicine, through remote monitoring. There's this new movement towards hospital at home that we heard about. And in a public health emergency, we saw that we could build a 400 bed hospital in one week, right? We saw that actually happen. Um, so we need to th take those learnings and move forward. And so I, I guess I would just echo kind of some of the points that we've heard earlier. We need to move forward together. It can't just be the Green Mountain Care Board, to your point, Elena. It has to be the state. It has to be hospital leaders, hospital trustees, communities, patients, providers, together thinking about what does that optimal delivery system look like. And we have to resist status quo bias because if we don't and we stay on the same trajectory, we're going to end up with hospital closures, suboptimal access, suboptimal quality, and cost growth that we can't afford. Um, on a more practical immediate level, I would say the Green Mountain Care Board, what we can do internally ourselves is we should be improving our tracking of trying to figure out over and under capacity. I think we can do that by gathering better data on wait times, uh, on borders in the hospital, um, whether they're boarding in the ED or I'll call them boarding in inpatient areas where they subacute, they should be moved out of, of that setting, but there's no subacute setting available to them. So we need to figure out that um, and looking at you know, we collect data on occupancy rates and average daily census, but we don't really um, do much in the hospital budget process with it. We probably should. And we should be looking at that data more carefully. And the analysis that was done by Berkeley Research Group projecting bed need, I think we should continue to do that. We might have to fine tune it and tweak it and, you know, update it with uh, 2020 census numbers and try and figure that out. But I think we need to, to continue to do that estimate of uh, capacity needs and see where we're at over and under capacity. So I think that's a question I guess I would put out towards the hospital budget team again and the data budget, te the data team. How do we better track over and under capacity and future bed needs? Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, I do, I do agree that there, you know, I think what I'm reacting to is that I, I don't disagree that a systematic system wide look is important, but we don't have like there's no. We're our system is not a system that is structured around central planning or. Uh, you know, creating it actually creating a, a, a structured delivery system, right? Like our system involves 14 independent boards of trustees and lots of other provider entities. And so I think we just have to acknowledge in the finding that having um, information and data about the system as it exists today and what and to Jess's point, projected potential needs of the population, that quite frankly all fits in very well with HRAP. But then um, to your earlier point, uh, Elena, is then what happens with that? And I know we're going to talk about next steps um, after we get through the findings, but I just think it's important to make sure that the findings don't sound central planning, like a central planning entity is going to be doing this because we don't have that. Like we don't have that type of system in this country and we alone are not going to create that um, for many reasons, including capacity, resources, appropriate staffing, appropriate, you know, contractors, et cetera. So, um, so that, that would just, these two findings to get, I agree, they do come together. I just think they need to be nuanced a little bit to be more explicit that what we're talking about is really more like HRAP, creating the data and information to inform multiple parties' decision-making. Um, 
I, that would make me feel more comfortable that we're not overstating um, sort of a what we personally as an entity can do, um, which has its resource limits, um, or b what we would think is necessarily going to happen as a result. Yeah, no, I think I think we can do that. Thank you. OK, any Elena? other? Oh, yes, yeah, please. Just, and this is a kind of a half baked th thought, so I probably shouldn't even say it. But um, um, <clears throat> one of the things that that I, I you know that's true is that in terms of the cost shift and in terms of the inefficiencies that may or may not be out there, you know, that BRG and others have, have kind of uh, identified, those payments all go through commercial insurers. And so um, my sense would be that the commercial insurances, uh, insurance folks would have some very insightful insight into the operations of, 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 of hospitals um, or providers in general, because they sit at a kitchen table somewhere and they negotiate a deal and you know um so to my my general thought is is to kind of keep the door open to to put um some of the burden on commercial insurers to with their economic um uh, capabilities to affect changes that are that are clearly identified as uh, areas for innovation or or inefficiencies to be fixed, um, instead of kind of keeping the money flowing, um, you know, I, I certainly agree with Robin. Is that there is no way that that we or any uh, board could, you know, kind of specify a specific joint, you know, as an efficiency. Although logic would say that that would be efficiency, but you know, these are separate institutions and unique institutions. And um, but we have in insurers that are married to those institutions. And in the long run, um, it's in the insurer's interest, I would think, to make sure the system is as efficient as it can possibly be. Um, so I, I just would would put that on the table that um, kind of seeking avenues with commercial insurance folks to to help. Um, unfund inefficiencies and, and to fund innovations um, is something that uh, you know we we might we might consider. Yeah, I guess I just want to follow up a little bit on that. I think this is an all hands on deck kind of exercise that has to happen. I mean, I think all stakeholders. There's so many stakeholders that have to be involved in this process, and I think part of maybe what we need to be thinking about is who needs to be at the table right to start moving things forward so um it, and to, to robin's point this is you know this is a lot of this is beyond the, the green mountain care board it's a conversation it's learnings that we've gleaned from our process but it doesn't mean that the green mountain care board alone can fix this we can't we are one piece of a larger puzzle so it involves the legislature it involves ahs it involves commercial payers it involves hospitals it involves communities patients i mean this is something that if we really want to uh, ensure a sustainable hospital system, we really need all hands on deck. OK. Any other thoughts before? And I'm not turning away. I'm writing notes, so. <laughs> um, OK. Or Tom Walsh, were you coming? No, OK. Sorry. I will go to the next one then. Um, so I will, once we have worked that out, I think reducing operational costs at the hospital level alone, we don't expect this to move the needle no. sufficiently to address the problem. Um, and so now we'll talk about volume. So what about increasing volume? So increasing volume may be warranted when there are gaps in access, but it could also lead to unnecessary expenditures and possibly worse health outcomes depending on how 
how that's done. The organization and delivery of services should be based on Vermonters needs and which services and care settings will yield the best possible outcomes. Um, healthcare reform and the shift to value-based care has been precisely focused on this issue. And according to um, some work by Mathematica on potentially avoidable utilization, um, there appear to be opportunities um, to further address some of the volume concerns that we've been talking about. Um, so in, in their analysis, they looked at readmissions within 30 days, um, ambulatory care sensitive admissions, avoidable ED visits. So this wasn't just for Vermont, they, they created a tool for um, rural hospitals across the US and, and came to present, um, I think it was last September around then. So if, if, if you need a refresher, but you know they found that um, some ambulatory sensitive admissions were upwards of 30%. Um, most hovering around 20. Um, same hospital readmissions were, you know, in the teens, um, but the proportion of revenue in, uh, for avoidable utilization in ED visits was, you know, between 20 and 40 percent, which um, appears to be pretty significant. Um, and so this, you know, I'm recycling a slide I, I stole from um, Dr. Elliot Fisher, who was here recently, just to talk about, you know, one of the impetus for healthcare reform was thinking about all the different sources of waste um, and how we might begin to get U.S. spending more in line with some of our peer countries. Um, you know, there are failures of care delivery, failures of care coordination, over-treatment, administrative complexity, pricing failures, um, and fraud and abuse. So some of these um, kind of fit into some of these discussions that we're talking about, um, and then other healthcare reform efforts that are kind of underway at the state. You know, so I think, you know, we can all kind of agree that just driving volume is, is not going to be um, a viable path for fixing this problem either. Um, and we know that there's support for this shift to value-based care. Um, it's quite bipartisan at this point. Um, and then we know that there was a, a refresh and a, and a recommitment to this view. And um, Liz Fowler, now the head of CMMI, you know, we need to find an, a way to bring everyone along and we can't have fee for service remain a comfortable place to stay, um, was something she said earlier last year. Um, we also know that the AHA has been, um, you know, pretty supportive of this shift and that the, during um, COVID, they issued another survey and found that 49% of healthcare executives say they have um, a greater interest now in participating in value-based care than they have before. Um, and then, you know, a um, an issue brief um, on global budgets. Um, they actually had some support for this approach, um, which is one of the you know ways that you can shift to value-based payments, um, and that would ensure access in rural communities. So you know that that is a theme that keeps coming back, but something that's perhaps worthwhile looking at given the um, you know the large support for for that approach. Um, so where are Vermont hospitals in their trans transition to value-based care? Um, on the right, you'll see the land category framework, which talks about all the different kinds um, of value-based payments and that this is not something that you traditionally, you know, switch on or off overnight. It has been largely opt-in um, to date. And they have category one, which is, you know, fee-for-service, no link to quality or value. Category two, fee-for-service with a link to quality and value. Category three, um, alternative payment models, so it means something different here, built on fee-for-service architecture, um, which is kind of where we are now, and then category four, population-based payment. And when I say where, where we are now, I mean pieces of our system are here now. Other pieces of our system are still in category one. Um, and then category four is really where, you know, the theory says we need to be before we can really focus on population-based um, outcomes, and that's population-based payments, and there's kind of a tiered approach. Um, I think, you know, one of the things, and we'll get back to it at the end, that we've been talking about is how do we get better reporting in our, you know, in our regulatory work on on what kinds of participation we're seeing. We've heard that, um, you know, there's some hospitals participating in value-based programs and outside of the state's all-payer ACO model, so that would be important to know. Um, but, you know, largely the proportion of revenue, you know, in 20, you know, it was largely non-existent before 2017. That's when Medicaid kind of came to the table. Um, and then we saw some increases. And in 2020, it's kind of resting around 15.7%. Um, it's a system-wide proportion of value-based hospital revenue from Vermont residents. And so, you know, that might be an opportunity. So, 
despite being leaders in their commitment to value-based care um, and the shifting to value-based payment, Vermont hospitals are still predominantly paid on a fee-for-service basis, which continues hospitals' reliance on these volume-driven strategies that we've been talking about um, in order to ensure their financial health. So, open to feedback and thoughts on this one. So, Elena, can you, can, can you go back to the prior slide? There. I just I just think it's important to note that <clears throat> you're looking at the proportion of revenue um, in prospective payments, and I recognize that 15.7 percent from the last budget process, and I think that was slightly lower than than uh, the well, it's it's in that range, but that percentage uh, is basically driven by Medicare payments. And Medicaid payments, and not and 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 not very much at all. Less than a percent uh, of it is is commercial payments, and I just think that's an important, you know, proportionality to keep in mind. Um, I, you know, when I look look at the at the hospital data, <clears throat> and I, you see that the Medicaid expanded and Medicaid traditional folks are in the 35 to 45 percent FPP broadly defined. And the um, Medicare is around 45%. And that's what gets gets you up to that 15 points or down to that 15.7%. But a, but a question I have is what is the right number? I mean, is there is there a target for fixed prospective payments? And let's say category three and category four payments that we want to get to to leverage the innovation and efficiencies we're hoping for. Is it 100%? Or is it 50 percent? Um, um, I don't know. I, 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 I can see from the hospital budget process where we're at, but um, I don't know where we want. I don't know where we want to be. I don't know if if our goal is 100 percent or 80 percent or 60 percent where we get to that tipping point where the efficiencies and innovations we're hoping for begin to come real. Um, just a thought. No, thank you, Tom, and I, I'm, I appreciate you bringing me back here because I think I wanted to talk with you about that and then one other point that I forgot to make here. Um, what it, I'll start with the, what is the tipping point? And I think there is no consensus because no one has figured this out yet, but what we heard from Eric Schell um, from Stroudwater, who is a CPA and has worked with ho rural hospitals all over this country, so this is bread and butter, he thinks 80% minimum is what you need to do to really change the incentive structure. And I think that's why global budgets are so appealing or population facility focused population based payments. There's a lot of ways to think about what that is, but basically the, if most, almost a hundred, <laughs> as many as you can get payments that go to a hospital are fixed, are paid prospectively and are paid based on the population they expect to serve, then they can stop worrying about volume and start thinking about how do I keep these people healthy. If you're only at 40, 50 percent, you can't you can't rethink your strategy for delivering care. You still have to worry about how am I going to get that last 50 percent. So I think that's been you know that's been kind of where my brain's been going with this. I think the other point I wanted to make here is a good one. You know. This is all this is value based care. We're not talking about fixed payments. We know that Medicare is a reconciled payment at the end. And I think that's one thing we've heard from hospitals does not work for them because they're still managing against that fee for service amount. And they don't know if that fixed, you know, while that fixed payment gives them flexibility in the interim, they still have it in the back of their minds. So I think we have to be clear that not all of these value based payments give you the same kind of incentives. While it might be better than category one, we're not there yet. Um, and so I think there's some conversations about how far do we think we need to go? Are we willing to go? I think we need to go all the way to category four, but how far as a state do we think we need to go? And, um, you know, I don't know that anyone has that right number, but I think there are a lot of um, kind of evidence and the evidence we do have points to the higher, the better. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll go back to the language. So, oops, we can see. Okay. I'm um, good. 
to Tom's point, I think you could potentially add, you know, sort of a recognition that Medicaid and the public payers have been a leader in this area. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Okay. Great. Um, so quality improvement and measurement. Um, so while for the first time, you know, we've kind of collated some quality data, um, this was part of the BRG analysis that was presented um, late last year. Um, we learned that the data are not reported consistently across Vermont hospitals. Um, they participate in different programs. And so, you know, you might not have um, reporting at all, or you might be reporting a little bit differently. And so, you know, there's no, nor is there consensus across hospitals as to the most appropriate hospital quality measures and for whom um, we spoke with quality directors, care managers, hospital leadership on this topic. And, um, you know, I learned a lot, but I don't think we've, <laughs> we've not yet landed anywhere. And so I think this sparked work with um, our partners at VPQHC, um, who are now convening a stakeholder group to work on establishing a quality framework that can be considered in the hospital budget process. And so we will have um, those voices hopefully back at the table to help us think about what what the right way to think about quality is, um, depending on, you know, what what kind of hospital you are. Um, and so the staff key finding here is really just to recognize this challenge and and, you know, commitment to this work. So there are likely opportunities to improve the quality of care being delivered to Vermonters. Um, for example, in some areas, volumes may not be sufficient to guarantee high quality of care for some services. In addition, ho Vermont hospitals rate of potentially avoidable admissions is below optimal levels, suggesting better care for patients with common chronic conditions is warranted. Um, so while this baseline data are helpful for highlighting general areas of opportunity, measures of hospital quality are not consistently reported and make systematic review of hospital quality difficult if not impossible. So I think, you know, we're sharing the data that we did find, but I don't think there's any action that I'm recommending the board take by any means, except let's see where this hospital quality framework ends up and then continue um, discussing with our stakeholders about how we best incorporate quality into the hospital budget process. Any thoughts, comments there? Hello, it's, uh, it's Tom Walsh. Uh, just a comment in the um, the quality measures that I've seen to date um, and outcome measures, there are um, some from an administrative standpoint, there are some from a financial standpoint, there are some from a clinical standpoint or medical, but we don't have um, routine collection of outcomes uh, reported by patients about their perceived health, their ability to function and fulfill their, their roles. Um, and uh, that's where quality assessment is headed. So in if we're thinking of building a system that would guide us in the future, uh, thinking how we can incorporate patient reported outcomes would be important. Very good point. I can add some language about that. Um, it's a very good point. Thank you. I like that idea um, a lot, Tom. Uh, I look forward to you know, to hearing what um, BPQHC's suggestions are. I know they're engaging in that uh, stakeholder group, and I, I imagine that's going to be a challenging conversation too. As you've noted, Elena, nobody can agree on the right set of measures. Um, we're obviously going to need input from the medical community. I, I, I know VPQ will be uh, facilitating that. I just want to add that Dr. Dupuy and Dr. Macy at Copley offered to engage the board on this topic, um, so I think we should definitely take them up on it. Um, and I also want to note that it's it's so far to date been really hard to assess quality in small hospitals. You know, if you look at the Medicare hospital report cards, basically they don't report measures if the sample sizes are too low. You just get NA in those categories. And as we heard from our consultants, it's the low volume, you know, if, if there's a relationship between low volume and quality, which we know there to be, we need to really understand the quality in those hospitals. So we need a better process to assess our you know quality levels in those in those low volume areas or for low volume procedures or things like that so i'm just going to throw out for discussion i know we can talk about this next week when we get to hospital budgets and i certainly know that this will be a part of a longer conversation that we'll have once we hear back from vpq hc but i think we might consider collecting data first of all some easy to collect data on 30-day readmission rates which we know medicare collects anyway reported for medicare but 
Um, there was an interesting study that I saw that was trying to assess quality in rural hospitals. And so I was looking at how they were assessing quality in those rural hospitals. And they looked at mortality rates from AMIs, uh, heart failure, strokes, GI hemorrhaging, um, hip fractures, and pneumonia. And they also looked at complication rates from elective surgeries. So I was thinking we could, you know, that seems like an interesting place to start potentially. Um, and another area might be revision surgery rates for surgeries that happen either at the same hospital or another hospital. So uh, we can get this data, I think, largely from the discharge um, database. Um, the study that was actually that I read that I looked at um, was a part of a, a larger study from the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project that pulled in state inpatient databases. Vermont was listed as a contributor to that, so this is data that might already be collected. Uh, and I would say that, you know, there's always the concern about small numbers, and I recognize that. So we could aggregate results over three to five years to increase sample size, you know, reduce some of the influence of an outlier in a, in a particular year. If we looked over three to five years, we could you know, smooth out even the COVID effect looking back in time. So I'm just going to throw that out there. But I do think that from from what we learned from the consultants, uh, we do need to to be assessing um, quality, particularly when as it relates to volume. So we need to come up with some measures that relate to that. I could um, just respond to Jess's comment a little bit. I, I would like to agree that incorporating uh, data, the healthcare cost and utilization project. HCUP, that data set has been is rich. It's been used um, data collected uh, for I think more than a decade. And it seems like we could crosswalk that with our data set um, to get some of their utilization data and some of their cost estimates. Um, they have not solved the cost definition issue either, but um, it'd be another window to look through. From a, a patient reported outcome measure standpoint, um, an organization where we may be able to learn more from um, the International Consortium of Health Outcome Measures, ICOM, is a, a good resource to help us all learn more about them, um, how, how they can be used, and how they can be implemented. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I had just one small suggestion, which is I wonder if we just um, because when I think about quality improvement in particular, it seems like it's, you know, it's not really a one and done and and I'm by no means a quality expert at all, but certainly in the areas where folks talk about quality, it seems like creating a culture of quality is really where a lot of uh, providers want to go. So I just wonder about kind of incorporating that concept of supporting a culture of quality um, in this finding. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and we can we can bring this to our meetings with VPQ and, and get some discourse around it. That's very helpful. Okay. Any other thoughts? One, one more thing, sorry to be. Um, oh, please. Being so, building off of what Robin just said, um, the group that's doing the most uh, that I'm aware of about quality improvement and sustainment and change management, they're pulling in theories of, of um, performance and efficiency um, in high reliability organizations. Those organizations began in nuclear medicine and aviation, the theories behind how do you sustain quality improvement? How do you build a culture that drives quality improvement? Uh, so um, for us to learn some more about high reliability organizations might be helpful. Great, need a note of that as well, thank you. Okay. So I will keep going. Um, so I'll pause again, <laughs> back to you. Um, are there, you know, if we've gone through these key findings, are there any other key findings based on, you know, conversations, analyses, um, some of our kind of thought leaders we've had in, um, you know, did we, did we go through them all or are there, are there gaps? <laughs> So my, I would suggest that we include um, 
a key finding or two related to COVID. And I think that you wove that in and with some of the findings, but I think it's important to acknowledge um, COVID's impacts and how it has been a disruptive force. And similar to the disclaimer in some of your comments earlier and Jess's comments earlier about some of the lessons learned, I think sort of incorporating that into an explicit finding um, is important both to acknowledge the current environment, but also to acknowledge that you know, there will be additional lessons that we learn from COVID moving forward as the pandemic becomes endemic, and that will inform, further inform, uh, you know, the work to date and the work as we move forward. Great, that's a great idea. Any other gaps, thoughts? This might be a small footnote, but um, in the Stroutwater presentation, um, he talked about the private sector growth in healthcare and uh, talked about CVS and Amazon and Walmart, et cetera. And as we go through this COVID situation, you can see that um, um, these large corporate players are playing a bigger and bigger role at the local level. Um, and I'm just, you know, I don't know how we get our arms around that, um, but if they're uh, absorbing a significant share of some market, you know, um, it, it might, it, it's, it's something that we might want to be aware of. I think that's a good point. Yeah, how do we measure and know when it's happening? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but uh, maybe Stroutwater does. Yeah, we can ask. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Tom. Pelham, I should be more specific. OK, um, I will move on. And of course, if, if you think of anything else, either main or Robin, did you have something? I just had to... one. This is also in the footnote category. But um, in terms of the age of plants stuff, um, we either have or, or are expecting several large CON projects from some of the hospitals that have the older age of plants. So I, I would just note that because that number may move significantly depending on the outcome of those CONs and that kind of thing. Okay, no, that's, thank you. I will, I will definitely note that. Okay. Um, okay, so now, now we're, we've talked about key findings. I think we all have a pretty good, um, you know, baseline for, for now, what's next? <laughs> Um, and so in the Act 159 report, um, this is the report that was given to us by the legislature um, to identify how we can improve hospital sustainability um, with all these other kind of key outcomes. You know, and so defining the work, we said, how can we ensure that hospital revenues are sufficient to cover the costs of operating a system that strikes the appropriate balance between efficiency and access in rural Vermont? Um, how can a sustainable hospital reimbursement ensure equitable access, efficient economic delivery, um, and improved health outcomes for Vermonters? And so I kind of took a stab at aggregating across the key findings that we've been talking about in more detail um, to, to try to get to some, you know, instead of having a laundry list of little things we, we, we could tackle um, or we, we should all tackle, you know, what are the, what are the key big picture systemic issues. So left alone hospital financial health is likely to deteriorate, potentially leading to hospital closure and healthcare affordability is likely to worsen for the commercial population. Uh, Vermont has numerous opportunities to redesign care in order to improve quality, efficiency, affordability and access to care for Vermonters. Um, and completing the transition to value-based payment models will enable the healthcare system to improve quality and control healthcare spending growth um, and allow us to seriously address affordability while maintaining access to needed services. So I recognize some of the feedback we've already received. Um, so this isn't aimed to kind of <laughs> distill down to the fine points, but to, but uh, you know, I'll pause here just in case you, you see kind of the big picture differently. Okay, <clears throat> that helps. Great. Um, so recommendation number one, um, so to establish a shared vision for the transformation of Vermont's healthcare delivery system to improve access, affordability, quality, and health equity, 
I did not put an actor here, but I think maybe I should recognize the many hands <laughs> outside of the board that may need to be at the table for this work um, to be extra clear based on some feedback we've already heard today. Um, so how, so I think this would require some appropriation for a contractor to lead um, state leaders, hospitals, and communities, this is, and advocates, you know, it's not an exhaustive list, um, in a process to assess the efficiency and quality of the current hospital delivery system and to lead efforts to design a system that optimizes access, quality, and costs in order to be sustainable in a value-based world. Um, so I think to your point, Robin, earlier, you know, we are not a central planning board. We don't have we don't have that here or in the US, I don't think anywhere. Um, but what what could a collaborative approach look like for establishing this shared vision? Um, and you know, might that be a way that we can all kind of work towards something to Jeff Tiemann's point in a positive way and um, build some positive momentum around um, delivering better care for Vermonters? So any thoughts, adjustments? Yeah, uh, Elena, I think the, um, I think in the second um, second bullet, leading efforts, I think um, being more explicit about collaborative efforts, leading lead collaborative efforts to design a system, and then that the first bullet, assessing the efficiency and quality, I think the slides that you've shown have done that. So I might put a bullet below lead efforts, and and say. Um, collaboratively build the tools to assess the efficiency and quality of the redesigned system. Right? We, we've got assessments of what's been going on. It's not good. We don't need more assessment of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think the step the step one here was what is that shared vision? I agree that whatever it is that we build needs to self reflect and be a learning system, um, but I think we don't know. So I can incorporate that element, but I and maybe um, evaluate is not the right word here. But um, but what is that shared vision? How do mm -hmm. we get there? Yeah, and there may be more data needed to say precisely what that looks like in some places. Oh, yeah. Elena, you, you talk about a contractor, and I think it's important to think about what skills do we want that contractor, skills and experience do we want that contractor to have? Um, and I think, you know, we, we ideally we would like somebody that has experience leading large hospital systems. You know, there are consultants out there that that have that experience somebody ideally with a medical background so they have the credibility um, and somebody from outside the state who doesn't have a vested interest in the status quo so i think those are some components of of who should be leading that process um and i don't know if that's helpful but yeah absolutely just make sure you don't whatever languages you land on don't run into rfp problems right so legal need to take a look at it. Yep. Thank you, Robin. This is Susan. I just wrote that down. <laughs> and I would actually recommend changing the word contractor to facilitator. OK. OK. So I. Um, I maybe I am just more of a pessimist having sat through years of the SIM grant <laughs> where we had $45 million and multiple stakeholder groups to design a system. Uh, it's not that easy to do. So I, I think what we need to kind of acknowledge in this process is that, um, you know, it's sort of a designing a system kind of implies that there is like a blueprint or a like a some systems design that then gets magically transformed, like the system magically becomes that way. Whereas I, to me, the way this process is more likely to be effective is that there's uh, statewide information and data about areas where we don't have access, we have too, all the stuff we've talked about, you know, where there's too much access, not enough access, um, 
the cost considerations so that the people who make the decisions, which in my mind, when you're talking about the hospitals are the hospital boards of trustees, that they then have more than just their little piece of the pie that they know about. And so it could include bringing together multiple regions um, to the to get to the point that like any one hospital is not going to have enough information or the ability to kind of think about uh, the bigger picture, which they uh, you know had indicated early in this process was the case. Um, so I think it, you know, perhaps some sort of regional type thing, but the process to me has to really be community based because like, I just don't see practically as a practical matter, how the change happens any other way than really engaging boards of trustees and hospitals. And, you know, maybe I, I'm throwing out this idea of more than one together, like different sort of re hospital referral regions that make sense with, and maybe an academic medical center would it be engaged to do multiple because they serve a much wider referral region. Um, but I think for it to be effective, like we did the process already where we had uh, the usual suspects at the state level sit together and quite quite a few people who weren't the usual suspects, quite frankly, in the SIM process. Um, there was a lot of good work that was done, but then the work was done and then it didn't get implemented. So to me, like engaging with the people who are making the decisions is kind of the key component if you want it to actually get implemented. So I do, I totally agree with the collaborative piece of it, but I think it also has to be clear that there's a, to me, I would advocate for a community focus. So statewide information data um, to provide the context that a, an individual community wouldn't happen have, but acknowledge that there's uh, community decision-making that's happening. And, and now there are pros and cons to that. That is going to be expensive. and time consuming. Yeah, that's helpful. Any other thoughts here? Just have to say, I unfortunately agree with Robin, you know, that, you know, in, in terms of my experience, I've never, I can't recall, I'm sitting or trying to recall one, but one of these consultant led, uh, you know, efforts to, um, you know, engender change just seem to kind of have a life and then, and then it goes away. And so somehow the decision making process has to be kind of more organically embedded in the population that is 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 going to be changed or try to be changed, um, but then again, you have it concerns about vested interest and in people, you know, kind of you know not being as aggressive as they, as they might be. So I don't know what the answer is here, but um, I, I I think you should ponder it a little bit longer. That um, that I just think a contractor facilitator. They come and go, and um, I look back on, you know, like the, the changes in edu in our education system, systematic changes across every city and town. You know that happened. You know, was driven by a Supreme Court decision. You know, and a lot of the changes at um, AHS were driven by Jane Kitchell and and uh, Con Con Hogan. You know, so um, you know people that were just passionate and committed to the cause and were all in. But they they had a Vermontness to them, you know, that gave them credibility. It's going to make a bad joke about adding the hospital budget to town meeting day agendas, but I won't go there. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, any other thoughts here? I think this is all really good. I think what, what I'm hearing is that this is all well and good, but we need to think about how to engage the deciders. Um, and that change is hard and that that part isn't a guarantee just because we put up the money to 
do some kind of statewide analysis. So we need to be thoughtful about how to make sure that if we, if if we, if the legislature goes that route, how does change then happen? Um, thinking through that. And maybe the thing to do here is to have like, you know, we could kind of brainstorm different sort of process options with pros and cons. Like you could have a couple different examples, right? Um, there may not be time given the report deadline of February 1st to do that, but that, you know, I, that's just a thought. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, good idea. Um, and even if we can't do it immediately, it's something we can keep thinking about. Okay. All right, so I will move on to recommendation number two, which I think would support whatever comes out of recommendation number one. Um, but explore moving hospitals to all payer perspective population based payments um, could be a global budget. And so I think there's I'm using that term, but it can mean a lot of different things, to different people. So, you know, a facility focused budget in which the majority, which can be defined number of ways, revenues would be um, relatively fixed. So but also flexible and sufficient to deliver high quality, affordable care to Vermonters equitably. Um, and so how, so I think we would need to appropriate funding um, for a contractor, I think in this case, um, to assist with the design of a facility focused all payer population based payment. Um, and then it's incorporation into a proposal for a subsequent agreement if we wanted Medicare to also be at the table in that payment structure. So thoughts on this? Do you agree with the approach and then how it's been framed or any adjustments? So to me, I think, you know, I think there's a path that we started down and feel like has some promise is moving to the fixed payments for certain sectors of the healthcare system. And I think the challenge that we've run into is that in a multi-payer system, getting consistency um, across multiple payers is not an insignificant challenge. So I do see this as a way to move that work forward um, and while also recognizing that we have the hospital budget process, which is a facility-based process, but has largely built on a fee-for-service chassis in the past. So this to me is sort of a way of trying to think about how we can re-envision the hospital budget process in order to um, incorporate uh, consistent um, fixed payments to that particular sector. But I do definitely agree we need uh, more work. Um, we did in the Act 159 report, we did include you know, several different options under this payment model with some uh, areas that we that we concluded we would need further study in order to actually implement it. So I do think it's important to do this well and not um, like we need the resources to do it well in order for it to be effective and and not harmful. So I was going to hold this comment till the end, but since Robin brought it up, I think that uh, I'll say it now in that in the report, there has to be a range of what the cost would be for each of these recommendations because this isn't something that can be funded out of the Green Mountain Care Board's budget. So this would require appropriations from the legislature. And if you don't have that information for them, it's not going anywhere. Well, for this one, we definitely have the range because we did that in the Act 159 report. Yeah. I, I wonder if, uh, and I agree with this recommendation, um, and I'm just wondering if there could be a uh, parallel recommendation, which is re regardless of whether we eventually end up at global budgets, which I know this is a this would be a process to explore, but we are moving towards value-based payment, you know, in some form or another, because the federal government is moving that way. I mean, that all, you know, all direction is pointing in that way. So I'm wondering if we might want to ask for uh, additional funding for hospitals to better prepare for that value-based world. I mean, effectively, the value-based 
payment model is going to ask them to turn their business model upside down and and they've they've dipped their toes in the in the deep end a bit but i'm wondering if there's a you know we know that there's a lot of federal money coming into the state right now and there's a lot of appropriating that's going to happen is this a good time to ask the legislature to fund some technical assistance to hospitals to better prepare for value-based payment and to you know think about how they could optimize their de delivery system even in their own siloed world to be prepared for when they're going to be held accountable for costs and for quality so just wondering if we might want to ask for some additional funding for the hospitals to better prepare them so, <clears throat> just as I'd, I'd like to follow that up i um planned on saying something similar later. The large organizations that I've been involved with previously that have undertaken efforts like this, um, whether Navy Medicine, Defense Health, the VA healthcare system, the, the training of the, of the healthcare delivery system is, is crucial. And it involves um, disseminating the principles and practices of quality improvement, understanding value, what, what do we mean when we're saying value-based? Um, the principles and practices of high reliability, just culture. There are a, a number of these things that um, those organizations, when they're trying to, to um, move, whether it's 14 hospitals, 20 hospitals, or 1,700, there's a, a a focus on um, providing the education resources along with the time um, for, for the people in the healthcare delivery system to do what's being asked of them, which is to change their business model. Thank you. Yep, I can add, add a bullet for that as well. <laughs> and a price tag. Nice job. <laughs> Yeah, and I definitely agree that I, that um, transformation dollars are needed. Um, and, but I mean, I there may be more in terms of the timing. There may actually be more flexibility on the timing there because if the federal money has to be used within a certain period of time, and the hospitals are still engaged largely in COVID, they may not have capacity to actually start working on this yet. So. That doesn't mean we shouldn't ask, but we certainly would need that kind of feedback from the hospitals having heard, you know, their limitations and give understandably, you know, given what's going on with COVID. And also I think we have to understand what the time limit is on the federal dollars. So I don't know, you know, when they have to be used by. So I think we have to learn a little bit more, but I think this is a good time to ask for money. It does seem like that. <laughs> Okay. Elena, yes. that's just the, the, again, this is a half-baked baked thought, but um, I'm just wondering if, if rather than looking at a whole 14 hospital process in a compacted period of time, whether or not, say, between now and the end of the all-payer model two, that we roll this out by working with three or so hospitals um a you know during, during a time period you know find ones that want to go in this direction um and and uh and maybe getting some subsidies uh um to you know to do that and to support it but to kind of you know build the process based on 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 a, a smaller set of hospitals um that you, you know like obviously uvm and, and and the network is is an animal of its own but kind of working with the others to get them in, into a successful place i mean we're talking about you know um pulling their bacon out of the fire of operating margins that are sinking them you know and 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 working to make them successful and and and, and better facilities serving their people and trying to do all 14 at the same point in time might be too heavy a lift, whereas if we can divide it up over the next seven or eight years, um, doing you know two or three hospitals a year, it might be a little bit of a more manageable lift. Just a thought. I guess I'm going to be a little bit negative on that, Tom, if you don't mind. I just I worry that if we don't look take a systems level look, 
really? Because wh which three hospitals are you going to pick? And they're all interrelated and their services are interrelated. I think we have to look at the entire system together um, and, and really understand how they're integrated, how they could be better integrated, you know, how we could coordinate care better, how we could find efficiencies across the entire system. So I just worry a little bit about taking a siloed approach, even a larger than one hospital siloed approach. I think the, the, you know, the, the worry is the worry is well taken. I'm I'm just trying to, you know, find find a path that is, you know, that 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 we're not trying to swallow too much at one point in time. But uh, I get your point. There's, there's some ability to to do both by by creating the system wide um, dashboard that Robin was talking about, and keeping that picture of the system in mind as we start as uh, whoever's doing this starts rolling toward that, you use the big picture to guide the progressive efforts, right? So not every place is gonna be able to run at the same speed at the same time once we have the data to guide us. So it makes sense to start and be progressive with it, I think. It's, it's, I think there's aspects of both. And I, I think also just to make sure as a, as a Vermont taxpayer that we're using our pennies wisely, um, if we're going to be designing something like this, I don't think we want to be going out to bid for a contract to design a different model every couple of years. Like I'm wondering if there's a design process and then the implementation, there might be options for piloted approach or some kind of staggered rollout. You know, there's there's different ways we can think about how to chunk it out, but I, I think um, we want to make sure that we're designing something that recognizes the unique needs of communities, but I think we have to consider them at, at, a, at the same time. Um, but that, you know, open to hearing other thoughts. Okay. All right, lots of great feedback here. I will, if you have more feedback, you know, feel free to say it later. Um, and I, I think we'll, I mean, I'll get to the end, but we'll be opening this up for public comment. So there's time to, to weigh in on it. Um, number three, um, so this is about the quality framework. So establish a hospital quality framework that can be incorporated into the hospital budget review process. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we'll continue partnership with VPQHC and stakeholders and ensure that resulting hospital quality framework is ultimately incorporated into the hospital budget review process. And I have lots of notes from some of the um, recommendations you all shared earlier, which were wonderful. And so if you have other thoughts on um, what we might bring back to that group, um, feel free to share or other recommendations worth considering here. Okay, I just don't want to cut you off too soon, but I will keep moving. Um, are there other recommendations that I've not articulated that you feel are imperative for addressing the key findings we agreed upon earlier? I think my only additional recommendation would be um, to think about whether we should at least recommend that Medicaid reimbursements be adjusted for inflation. So, you know, I, I think that if, if they're not, if they don't keep pace with inflation, it threatens the financial solvency of our hospitals and it actually impedes their recruitment of workforce, which you know is a big issue and it's placing a big burden on a, on a shrinking commercial population. It's not sustainable. It may fall on deaf ears as we've tried this before, but I think it would be um, important that we at least acknowledge that component of the, the sustainability issues. I would I totally support that, and I you know I think is I mean because we we always want to be partners. Um, but that is such a, a a big or it is a, a big hole in the in the hull of the ship that we just can't avoid it. Um, and uh, so I would support that. I would probably word that on a per member per month basis um, because looking at the I you know if you look at the information that they presented last week to the emer the emergency board the diva that uh, the caseloads are they're projecting are actually dropping but their um, and their per member per months are ranging between 
a half a percent and three point something percent. Um, but uh, but because of the caseload dropping, um, I, I would stick to per member per month so that you kind of neutralize the inflation uh, increase. Um, uh, you know, based on caseload. Great. It, it also might make sense. Um, I have not followed, uh, to be frank, the details of the Medicaid budget projections this year, but they, uh, DIVA did come to the Prescription Drug Technical Advisory Group to speak to some of their budget pressures um, in relationship to that particular group's recommendations that had uh, dollars needed. Um, so it, I, I would do a little homework here to see what the Medicaid budget projections are and if there's a deficit or, you know, budget challenges that we recognize that in the finding so that it's not, you know, it's a little more holistic. Okay. Any other recommendations? I would fine tune that recommendation in that uh, when you're you're talking about uh, a blanket statement about uh, keeping pace with inflation, we've tried that once before; it didn't work. But I think if you can equate it to terms that everybody understands with the reality that is happening now with the workforce and the incredible pressures that um, that's going to create um, on what I would call um, health care inflation um, in the next couple of years, they, it might be something that people would latch on to better. And I would hope that, and I, again, like Robin, I have not um, seen the the diva budget um, but I would hope that they're taking into account the fact that um, across all providers um, there are going to be very large inflationary pressures that um, aren't normal so we we can work on fine-tuning that Great, thank you. Okay, um, so next steps, kind of the internally focused um, thoughts, and I, I won't be exhaustive here, I, I, because I feel like I, you know, there are a lot of other Green Mountain Care Board staff who who have a lot to contribute here that aren't up here with me today, but um, you will certainly speak with in the near future. Um, but, you know, evolving our regulatory levers. And I think Mike, Michael Barber did a great job going through, um, you know, where our authorities lie. Um, but hospital budget review would be a great place to start. And so I just kind of populated some ideas here. Um, you know, for this year, would it be possible to report revenues according to some, you know, I know we started working on this on, according to the land framework, um, include price and cost coverage in information which I think we talked about earlier today in NPR change in charge decisions. How would we do that? Um, track annual growth of commercial hospital prices on a per capita basis and how much those prices are contributing to overall trend. Um, and then, you know, maybe in out in the future, I don't, you know, I think we need to understand what this would require on the parts, you know, on in terms of burden on hospitals, but how could we track fixed versus variable costs? Um, there's a study happening right now to look at, you know, rural hospital fixed and variable costs is a really important indicator of financial health and sustainability. Um, and then, a you know, other work that um, we've been thinking about, you know, clinical view on incorporating health equity into the hospital budget process. Been working with um, some residents um, who've been thinking about that, who have some thoughts for us. Um, so that might be out in the near future. But I wanted to pause here and and get your feedback on what you think we could do this year. And if I put these in the wrong year, feel free to give feedback what we could do next year or subsequently, um, you know, absent all these other larger recommendations that could take place, what what can we do given what we've learned over the last couple of years? I think for me, um 
the I think working towards reporting, I think the land framework is important. I don't know if that's reasonable this year or not, uh, particularly if we're expecting to still be in a pandemic posture um, where we're, you know, kind of doing a lighter process than is typical. Um, the And I also think that figuring out the price and cost coverage or a more nuanced way to approach uh, the high level benchmarks that we use is important. Again, we would have to have that figured out in like the next month in order to put it into guidance in March. So I don't know if that's feasible for staff. Um, that seems kind of quick to me, but I don't know. Um, but those to me are um, priorities. And um, I think we've talked for a number of years about different sort of trying to think about moving towards per capita benchmarks and there's been data issues there. So that again seems to me something of interest, but not sure. And you seem to be in your suggestion here seems much narrower than what we were talking about before but uh, I think it you know directionally these look interesting I'd want to hear from the hospital budget team and the data team about feasibility and timing because yep. I don't feel like I'm in a place to judge that well yep. Sim similarly I'm not I don't feel in a place to understand the feasibility and timing issues um, but I like the directionality of the per capita basis. I think that that, that becomes important. I think um, earlier in this session, um, Jess mentioned the HCUP data set, and that would have utilization data that we could incorporate into the budget review. And I'm, I'd be interested in exploring what quality measures we have available to us, if any, now so that it's not just a review of the financial statements. All right, if we're moving toward value, value um, prioritizes more than just the financial aspect. Yeah, Tom, I don't know if anyone is, you may or may not know this yet, but we had started moving towards incorporating more uh, beyond financial, which we scaled way back during COVID. So I think, you know, during COVID, we really tried to retract and just do the basics, understanding right. sort of the situation. Yeah, I want to be sensitive to that, of course. And, and so thanks. I don't know about the feasibility or the timeline, but those are some of the thoughts. Okay. Else? Um, really, really, yeah. I this is very one quick thing yes. related to the slide is um, next week we have our hospital finance team presenting and I know um, our data team will be available as well as our policy team kind of as backup to that um, presentation. So I think a, there could be opportunity to have a bit more discussion with them on this next week. That, that's where I'd like to see this go because I think these are great, great questions and points to make, but feasibility is a big question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think <clears throat> step two would be, you know, so hammer out kind of the vision for the hospital budget process. And I think with, with that kickoff discussion next week um, would be great. And then thinking about how, um, where the intersections are with insurance rate review, um, CON, ACO budget review and certification. We've talked about the potential next federal agreement. We don't know exactly what that will look like, but um, you know, where where are the opportunities to to weave some consistency through um, what we're learning? So that would be an ongoing conversation. Um, any other thoughts here? I, mean, I think Susan kind of teed that up nicely, but okay. Um, then that is all I have for you today. And I, I did want to mention um, that public comment will keep open. I think we decided until the 26th through end of day 26th so that um, I know it's shorter, but 
I'm sorry, I was out sick. Um, or maybe it can do the 28th since we've only presented it today. I can do through the 28th and then the reports do the first. So I will have a weekend to weave in any public comment that we hear after today's board meeting. So I'll pass it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And thank you for all your hard work on this uh, topic. Uh, at this point, we're gonna open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? And I'm going to call on Jeff Tiemann first. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Tiemann with the Vermont Association of Hospitals, for those who don't know. Um, another interesting and thoughtful discussion this afternoon, and I apologize that I couldn't hear all of it because of other things going on that pulled me away at various points today. But I do appreciate the opportunity to make a few quick points that I've been sharing this week with anyone and everyone I can. Um, the first is that if you can give blood, please do and encourage others in your life to do so as well. Our hospitals are in the middle of a severe blood shortage that is growing and dangerous, and it's easy to give. You can go to redcrossblood.org, type in your zip code and find where to donate. Um, second, I encourage all the attendees of, these, of this meeting, and I see there are a lot today, um, to advise your family and friends and others that even if testing is difficult to find, Please don't seek COVID diagnostic tests in hospital emergency rooms that are full and overwhelmed with patients who need urgent medical care. And, and third, when you visit hospitals and doctor's offices, when you do go there, um, be grateful and kind to the people delivering care. Kevin's wife is one of those people. My partner is another. We know firsthand how stressed they are. So I just think all of us can be amazingly helpful by just being sensitive to what our care teams are managing right now. As far as the sustainability discussion, the hospital association and our members will continue to stay engaged as the work proceeds and appreciate especially the comments made today around community driven decision making. So thank you so much and I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, Jeff. Very important uh, messages out there. And uh, um, I think what I heard uh, most recently is a 24 hour supply of uh, blood. Is that correct, Jeff? Um, I don't. I don't know, Kevin, that it's that quite that dire and it varies from facility to facility, um, but facilities are making decisions about procedures and and other um, clinical you know, decisions based on the supply of blood. So um, and it's only growing, unfortunately. So we're engaged with the Red Cross and we're engaged with the state and doing everything we can to try to ramp up collection and, and reduce um, sort of administrative barriers that can make it challenging. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Next, I'm going to call on Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, two or three comments. I really don't have questions. Uh, one of them you is could that speak I, up a little, Ham. I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, I'm, that's unusual. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> a little better. A little better. Wow. Okay. Um, anyway. Uh, the uh, a few a few comments. Um, one of the things I think that is that 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 people may not uh, take into account adequately. Maybe they do, but when you're looking at this whole problem, um, I think that for the English majors might refer you to Ernest Hemingway, who said once that when asked how think how people went bankrupt, he said slowly at first and then very fast. And you're already, we are already, I think, in the very fast stage. The, uh, and so you, I don't think you have way out there to begin to, to, to do the kinds of things that you, you have to do. Number two, um, I think that you can look at some, one of the things that the, the consultants have, but that, that have the consultants that you've had in here from, from uh, Stroudwater to Mathematica to Burns, et cetera, had some very valuable stuff to say. One of the most, I think, was to look at Geisinger, um, which is one of the top performers in the United States. It's regularly considered in the same breath as uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Mayo Clinic, um, UW Seattle, and so forth. They have roughly the same, they have an area five times as big as we do, five times. They have nowhere near as 
accidentally a good uh, road network because almost all of our hospitals, all but three of our hospitals, are right smack on an interstate so that the so that the travel times between hospitals in Vermont are dramatically reduced from what they were in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, that's just going to be a major factor. They have one they have one critical access hospital and we have eight. Um, I just I think I, I just think that needs to be a factor. Number three, my last comment is I really think that uh, trying to weigh it all, okay, um, is, is that the you really need I think that uh, Robin and Tom Pelham basically have it right here. Uh, you know, it's going to be you can't you're not going to this is a nasty problem what to do with it. It's just really politically wickedly hard. Okay. And you're not going to solve that problem by handing it off to some guy from away. That just is not going to work in the same way. I don't know whether it was Tom. I think Tom's experience is right. You get this really smart guy. He takes all the political heat. Everybody blames him. And then he goes away and this thing, and then the thing goes away. And so it's just going to be, it's just going to be very, very hard. Um, and I, I, I'll make one fi other comment. The, if you look at the system that needs to be worked on, the fact of the matter is that, that almost 60% of the whole problem is the UVM health network. And the UVM health network cost performance is hugely uh, superior to the whole rest of the system. And so that, that and, 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 and if, if you step in and mess with that, that would just be dumb. Um, so your problem really is, you, you, and then you secondly, your biggest one of your, your second biggest player overall is Dartmouth, which is outside your risk, outside your reach. They deliver all the tertiary for the East Coast, and that includes all the way over to Bennington and Brattleboro in the South. Um, they also they do um, they and and they do. A, they, they, and their reach, they reach on, on tertiary care, uh, not only into central Vermont, uh, but also, and not only into western Vermont, they actually draw some patients from northeastern New York, and they have, you have nothing to do with them. So if you take a look at all the care, probably 70% of the care is in charge of people that, that, it was, I, your staff is great. I've, I've, I've looked at these, uh, these kind of staffs. I've looked at these since 1983. That's longer than anybody else. This is by far, by far, by a long reach, the best staff that I have ever seen in the healthcare arena. Okay. So I'm just saying, this is a really tricky problem. You're going to, you're going to have to sit down there and you're going to have to say, we're going to have to eat some real political heat here or you're not going to get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. And next, I see that uh, one of our uh, team directors has his hand up, Patrick Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Can, yes. Great. Yes, this is probably a little unusual, but I wanted to add some commentary for consideration of this work. What a great conversation. It's also very nice to have a fully rounded board uh, in place and active in the discussion for the first time in a few months. So uh, I really appreciate the discussion today, but I wanted to preface my comments by saying that as a member of the board here, I'm not lobbying for any party when I say this. I'm just putting those thoughts forward for consideration on the topic today. Um, but being in my position of overseeing the hospital budget process for um, <clears throat> a few years now, um, but the finance team has also taken up some legislative charges of reviewing the Brattleboro retreat and the state's uh, designated and specialized services agencies, which are the community-based mental health and developmental disabilities infrastructure here in Vermont in kind of a unique position uh, to make some of these comments. But I, we, I think we missed a couple of significant items here that should be considered as part of the stakeholders group that was discussed earlier and looking at how we changed the current system. And those two items are twin crises that existed uh, for hospitals in the decade plus leading up to COVID that have really been exacerbated by COVID. Um, they will also be there in the post COVID world and they may be worse by that time, uh, which is unfortunate um, <clears throat> because they don't heal like a broken bone or a surgically repaired joint. And those are the mental health and substance misuse crises uh, that still exist in our society today. 
and we have EDs that are being renovated to meet the demands and necessities of these crises, even doing going so far as having to limit ligature risks um, and and put people into more modern bays so that there's less disruption to other folks coming into these facilities. Security staff are being hired. That is also part of the staffing crunch that we're hearing now is that security is being undermined by what's happening. We have staff and security and violence on staff, higher insurance premiums, work and compensation claims are going up, unreimbursed or under reimbursed beds being occupied by patients suffering from these conditions, multiple readmittance and an inappropriate level of care as these folks who are physical care providers are not able to adequately care for folks in these conditions. And these are patient care issues primarily, but they also have major cost pressures on the system and we've never looked at what those are or lost reimbursement from some of this activity. Um, but if we're going to constitute any sort of change, I think we have to invite folks who work in that space to the table so that the people who are suffering from these issues can receive an adequate level of care. Um, and then that will allow us to get a really good read on the capacity of our hospitals, because right now they're being asked to do things that they're not trained to do. So. I just wanted to add that to the conversation as that has come into my circle over the last couple of years and, and um, seems to be of, of something that needs to be addressed in the state and taken more seriously as we look at health care reform. Thank you. Okay, is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, uh, I'll uh, draw the period of public comment uh, for today to a close. And again, I want to thank Elena. And I'm not sure if Mike is back, but if he is, thank Mike as well. And uh, it's been a great discussion, one that will continue. And uh, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? No so moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Tom P and seconded by Robin to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. If you're able, give blood, and if uh, you're not able, try to spread the word.